All right. Well, thank you all for joining and being part of today's um, webinar. You are welcome to the Westy Girls High School webinar series. Um, this is our first for the year. And uh, my name is Dr. Bertha Ayi. Right. Well, thank you all for joining and being part of today's um, webinar. You are welcome to the Westy Girls High School webinar series. Um, this is our first for the year. Oh, sorry for that interruption. Um, this is our first webinar for the year. And uh, today we have a very exciting um, speaker who is going to be talking about breaking the glass ceiling. And uh, she's in the person of Mrs. Patience Achiano. So I'm going to start with an opening prayer. I will introduce um, our webinar uh, committee members, and then we'll dig right into it. So shall we say a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this opportunity to get together as alumni of our esteemed Wesley Girls High School. This webinar series is supposed to empower us, encourage us, and um, show us how to get ahead in this life. We commit the whole event into your hands, the speakers, those who are coordinating things in the background. We pray for your presence to be with us as always, that at the end, it will be a delightful time together, that out of this, new ideas will come up and people who feel they're lagging behind in their career paths will be invigorated to just press on and push on. We thank you so much for answered prayer in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. All right. So um, I, first of all, I want to thank our speaker, Mrs. Achiano, for agreeing to be part of the webinar. And I'm going to briefly introduce um, the webinar members of the committee who work so hard in the background to make this event possible. And so um, I want to thank uh, Ms. Emma, Emma Engman from the 1984 year group, Ms. Beatrice Anua Bru from 2004 year group, Dr. Hannah Aite, 1993 year group, Ms. Rabna Kumi, 97 year group, and also president of OGA North America, Ms. Gifty Emisa, 1997 year group, Jeanette Kwakupom, who is from 1973 and vice president of OGA National, Ms. Mercy Kwashi, 1994, vice president OGA UK and Ireland, Professor Ifwa Hesse, 1990, 1969, and immediate past president of OGA National. Sheila Arthur, 1982, year group, immediate past president of OGA UK in Ireland, and Miss Samantha Proja, 1983, president, 1983 year group and president of OGA UK and Ireland. And um, just a few house rules on the format of the webinar. Mrs. Achiano is going to be giving a presentation that will last probably 45 minutes. And during that time, just get your pen and paper ready and be ready to take any notes because she's going to be um, sharing a lot of pearls that have helped her to get to where she is. And um, I'm going to be introducing her in a moment. And if you look on your screen at the bottom, there's a Q&A section. You can type in questions as she speaks, or you can also um, put it in the chat room. And um, if all that does not work for you, you can also raise your hand and we can either call you in or have you type up what you want to say. So let me introduce this wonderful lady who has agreed to be with us today. Mrs. Patience Enyonam Achiano. Um, I used to call her Kosi in my Wesley Girls, Kosina. It's a member of the 1986 year group. Um, she's an award-winning chief executive, currently the group chief executive officer of Hollard Ghana Holdings, a subsidiary of Hollard International, South Africa, and a director of both boards of the company's subsidiaries. Hollard, Hollard Insurance Ghana and Hollard Life Assurance Ghana. Prior to this, she was the first Ghanaian woman to be the managing director of Barclays in Ghana, now APSA Bank Ghana. She is a solid finance professional and a banker with over 26 years experience in finance, banking, and now insurance. Under her visionary leadership, Hollard Brand has now gained prominence and visibility in Ghana and has introduced some innovative products, including Ghana's first virtual insurer, a chat box named Araba Holland or Mibambo, a micro insurance product with monthly premiums as low as one Ghana cities, 
and the Asunje product, which provides insurance for micro, small, and medium enterprises. Her recent personal awards and accolades include Africa Business Female Leader of the Year in 2020 at the Africa Business Leadership Awards in 2021, Insurance Leader of the Year 2021 at the first Business Woman in Finance and Insurance Awards held by the Institute of Chartered Global Investment Analysts. She's also won Marketing Woman of the Year 2019 by the Chartered Institute of Marketing in Ghana. And all these have come because of the track record and the results she produces as she works in all these various places. She's also been named the Outstanding Group CEO of the Year 2019 at the Fifth Ghana Finance Innovation Awards, Woman of Excellence 2019 at the Ghana Insurance Awards, and Best Woman CEO of the Year 2018 at the Ghana Insurance Awards. Patience is a certified professional accountant and a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants in Ghana. She is a founding member of both the Executive Women Network and the International Women's Forum Ghana. She's also on the board of Ecobank Ghana Limited and Haptel Ghana. Patience is married to lawyer Kwame Achianu and has two children, Irama Ampima Achianu and Nana Benin Kojo Achianu. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mrs. Patience Achianu. Thank you so much for joining us. We're ready for you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction, Betha. Good evening, ladies. And uh, before I get into the conversation, I'd like to say a very big thank you to the organizing committee for inviting me. Uh, I feel uh, this is a privilege, really, and I don't take it for granted. So thank you for this opportunity. And I'd also like to say thank you to my personal assistant, Janet, for putting the presentation together. She's not an old girl, but I think from today we'll, have, we'll adopt her as one. <laughs> So I'm excited to be here, really, um, because it's always great to share the little I know and uh, to hear what others have to say as well. And uh, how I'll take this um, chat forward is to say, start with a bit about myself and then launch into um, what uh, a glass ceiling is, a few definitions and my own definitions, so that we have a common platform um, to start from, and then some of the factors that lead to this um, phenomenon of glass ceiling. And we'll talk about um, how, from my experience, you can overcome and, and get to where you are meant to be. And then we'll also, so as I'm having the conversations, I'll touch a bit on the imposter syndrome, because that is um, a, a feeling of inadequacy that a lot of people in top jobs, even on their way, and even when they get there have. So we'll touch on it and, and I'll give some uh, suggestions about how you know, we can continually overcome it. And then I'll end with uh, how we get on board. And I'll start with my experience and then add on, and then we can take questions from there. So a little about myself and I'll start. So Janet will be, um, showing the slides. I don't know whether you can see the slides, but starting with a little about myself. So I entered uh, Wesley Girls in 81. And um, at the time, I was fatigued. <laughs> I was so exhausted because I really worked so hard, you know, to get into Wesley Girls, worked so many past questions that my first three years were rest time for me, if you like. And uh, I hardly studied much. You know, I wasn't serious at all. I barely scraped through. Of course, I passed barely, you know, but my potential didn't come out in the first three years in school. And I remember how that, so I suddenly realized, you know, how serious it, it was. And, you know, for those of us who did the O level, A level, you know, in form four, so from form three to form four, there's this exam that we do, and that's where the sheep are separated from the goats, you know, so to speak, that the sharper ones get into, if you like, 
you know, the A1, A2, and A1, A2 are the science classes with A2 being science without ad math and then A1 being with um, ad math. And then you have G, G1, G2. That, that's just uh, perception really, but a lot of people wanted to be in A1, you know. And of course I wanted to be in A1, even though, you know, nobody knows whether they would pursue their science aspirations after they finish O levels or not, but everyone was prestigious. And I recall not making it to A1 because of my math, the, the scores I got in the math um, test at the time, but being very certain that, you know, I deserve to be in A1. And therefore after the uh, O level going and doing the additional mathematics on my own, and proving to myself I could do it. And I did get a one in it, you know. So it's just that determination. And I also remember there was a colleague of mine who also believed that she deserved to be in A1. And she had the opportunity to go to America to do medicine. And she's now a very accomplished doctor, you know. So it's just that conviction. I say this not out of um, regret or resentment or anything. No, nothing like that. Because I believe in purpose. I believe that God orders our steps. You know, and even things that look like challenges and mistakes, you know, work out for our good. So I'm not, but I'm just saying it to encourage somebody that when you believe, you know, in something, you should go for it and not allow other people to tell you you are not capable or up to it. And then, of course, after Wesley Girls, I went to the School of Admin and, and studied accounting. I, I, I did that accountancy option. And um, I did that because, of course, I had a, found a strong foundation of math, even though you don't need a lot of mathematics in accounting, you need arithmetic, really. But those people who, who love figures are more comfortable with accounting because there's a lot of figures, so many figures you have to manipulate and juggle, you know, all around, you know. So having that strong foundation of uh, mathematics, I easily opted to do accounting, which was an option that was actually feared by a lot of girls, you know, um, at the time, I don't know whether that has changed, but in a class of 40, there were just five of us, you know, which um, showed how people then thought accounting was too much, too many figures, you know, and that helped me. For me, that was one of the best decisions I'd ever made. And let me just say that when I finished A-level, I didn't know what to study in the university, but my dad thought it was a good idea to do um, admin. And when I got into admin as well, I didn't know what option to do, but I was strong in math. He said, you're good in math. And what he said that I'll never forget is that he had never seen an accountant that was hungry before. So go ahead and do accountancy. And based on counsel, sound counsel, I went ahead and did the, uh, the accountancy option. And that was the best decision. I think that, you know, um, I, I, I took so early on in life because it just set me up, you know, for what followed after. And my first um, career opportunity was I haven't done the national service at uh, the finance department of um, the University of Ghana was to then go to Cooper's and Library. It's actually PwC now to train as an accountant. And I was there for three years, then decided to go back to the School of Administration, which is the University of Ghana Business School now. For those of you who are wondering what School of Administration is, um, I, I went back there to do an MBA in finance. And then I, I came back to consultancy, accounting consultancy again, and worked with Ernst & Young for a year and a bit, then decided to go into what we call industry to practice my accounting, having qualified as an accountant. So. I, I, my first thing in industry was with Lincoln Community School. And Lincoln Community School is an American school in Ghana. At the time, it was the only American school in Ghana. And everything was imported from America, including the people, test books, even pens and pencils were imported. You know, Because the idea was to make it the place feel like America, look and feel for um, expatriates, you know, the uh, American expatriates living in Ghana and others who wanted a taste of the American education. So it really provided an environment um, to, to um, experience multiculturalism really, and, and how to work with people from different parts of the world, which was 
great experience for me. And um, it was a good environment. And for the first time, I, I was earning um, dollar peck salary. So people, would, somebody would have thought, hey, you've arrived. But very soon, I realized that that wasn't the place for me because I was thinking progression. What next? You know, and for me, I think what next a lot. After a while, I begin to be restless and I'm thinking what next, you know. And so I, I had a contract and the contract was due to be renewed. But I said I, I wasn't going to renew the contract because and that was after a year, by the way, because immediately I was like, so after finance manager and I got in there as finance manager, having taken over from an expatriate because prior to my becoming finance manager, everyone else was who doing the work of uh, the finance manager or the business managers, they call it the, you know, was either an American or, you know, white. Let me be blunt about it. You know, I was the first black person and a Ghanaian at that to take over that role. So there was a lot of expectation. And I must say that I exceeded the expectations. They even gave me a certificate of excellence. And I asked the superintendent, the, the head of the school at the time said, I'm struggling to replace you. It was a good feeling. So it's, it gave me the confidence I needed to move on with my career. And I realized I couldn't, what would I be after business manager? Really, I couldn't be the head of the school because I'm not in academia, you know. And so there's no scope for me to progress in a place like that, however nice the environment. So quickly, I decided to move to the banking industry where I thought I could sort of um, make something out of my career. So I got an opportunity and it was through a friend of mine who heard that I had, um, hadn't had taken up the renewal in Lincoln of my contract in Lincoln School. And through a friend of mine I'd worked with in Coopers and Libran and he had moved to Standard Chartered. So he was like, oh yeah, there's this position in um, the finance department of Standard Chartered, bring your CV and, and, and let them interview you. So I did exactly that. They looked at the, the head of HR at the time, looked at the CV, said, okay, this looks good. We had an interview and then I got the role. And I entered at mid-career level. So that meant accelerated progression once you could prove yourself. And I got the opportunity to move to the next level, which was the number two role in the finance department, which was financial controller. I did that for, I think, four to five years. Then I decided to move to another department in um, Standard Chartered Bank. And why did I decide to do that? Because at the time, um, they were recruiting for the head of finance, the CFO, chief finance officer. And I, I showed interest, but what the recruiting manager, who at the time was the regional head of finance based in the UK, said to me was, um, I, don't, I don't want a number cruncher. I want somebody who understands the business you know, the, the banking business, it knows how to make, you know, money and rather than a number cruncher to be CFO. I took that as a challenge. Somebody would have been offended. I said, okay, bring it on. So I went to corporate um, banking. There wasn't any role for me. <laughs> so everyone was like, you are too senior, you know, for um, the, the role that is available. I was like, I'll take it because I want to learn. So I took a role. Of course, I didn't get a pay cut or I didn't get a demotion. I had my own because the, the, your grade is your grade, really. You know. But the job I was given was you know, a lower grade job. Let me put it that way, because I had to learn from scratch. So I started learning from scratch and then supporting the teams there. And I was there for two years. And that really grounded me. Again, it was an extreme. I, I wasn't to know what that would mean for my CV, but I guess my steps again were being ordered. You know, and that was an invaluable um, experience because then I got to really understand the banking business, how to give credit. I even did a credit certification, analysis certification, worked with a team that supported clients. And in the banking industry, it's, it's all about customer um, service and client relationships. So I, I got experience, of, you know, with that uh, during my two years stint in corporate banking. And then through um, a recommendation, there was a role in um, Standard Chartered South Africa um, after two years in corporate banking. And I was recommended for the role by 
my previous boss, so in finance. So they reached out to me and then through a number of interviews, I went and took the role, which at the time was financial controller of Standard Chartered Bank in South Africa. And I did that for six months. Then my boss said, my boss was the chief finance officer, which is the, in the finance world, um, the highest role, which is like head of finance and reporting, is present on the board and reporting to the MD, um, said, well, he said he was tired of, of, of um, his role and he wanted another opportunity in another part of the business. So he recommended that I could, to the MD, that I could do the role. And then the role was given to me. That one day I was financial controller, the next day I came and I was chief finance officer, you know. And I did that for a while, not for too long. So I was in South Africa for an, under two years. And I, I had to leave because of family considerations. I was struggling to juggle. My husband is a lawyer by profession. He had his own practice in Ghana. He wasn't so willing to totally relocate. You know, so it was like, well, how do we sort this thing out? And it was taking its toll on me. So I was like, oh, I think I want to just go back. And so my kids were small. You know, it was a bit of so the family concentration took Kristen and then um, took, uh, you know, um, was, uh, took priority, I beg your pardon. And then um, how did I get my, 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 the role I got back in Ghana? Again, through my networks, I reached out to somebody who told me they were looking for a finance director in, in Barclays, Ghana. And um, I knew the, 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 the previous finance director, I was with him in another organization I'd worked with and he had moved on. So it became vacant. And then they were looking for somebody with a particular skill set, which really matched mine, you know. So they shortlisted me for the interview and I went through a series of interviews there uh, recruiting um, managers were based in Dubai because the head office for Africa was in Dubai at the time. So we did a series of interviews, including going to Dubai, Lagos, etc. Then they said they found the right person and I got, I got the job. So they actually, you know, I, I relocated um, totally at their expense from South Africa back to Ghana. And so I came in in November 2008 as finance director of Barclays Bank in Ghana. And uh, I, I did that for five years. And then my boss at the time, my predecessor to the, the role of MD, um, my boss at the time also got an opportunity outside, having done the role for the MD role for five years, decided to uh, seek other interests. So the MD for Barclays role became vacant. And when he was leaving, he told his boss that I could act in the role whilst they searched for the right candidates. So I got the opportunity to act in the role um, from April of 2013. And I think I did, I did that for six months. And, and then through, uh, they, they actually went out to look for uh, people, so internal, external candidates. And then at the end of it, I got the role in, in October, you know. And then, of course, having done that again for five years, so I was in Barclays for a total of 10 years. I began to think that, you know, I needed a new challenge. And a whole lot came along, and I thought it was the right opportunity at the right time. Even though I was not 100% ready, because I didn't done insurance before, really. You know, and uh, I also thought there was a, a bit of unfinished business in terms of uh, long-term compensation I'd left behind in Barclays. I, I thought, well, there's never a right, a 100% right time. So I took the leap again. And three years on, I don't regret it at all. So here we are. In addition to what I do professionally, I've, I've, I've also uh, set up two uh, professional women networks as co-founder. I founded EWN, which is Executive Women Network, uh, with five other female CEOs in Ghana. And it's now we've handed over to um, the next generation, if you like. And um, it's doing fantastic, really, really well. 
and I'm also a founding member of the International Women's Forum, which is actually an international, um, an American organization that has gone international now. So that's, you know, what I do to support the cause of women because I love to see women rise. So in a nutshell, that's me. I think, so we'll move to what I think a glass ceiling in, and some of a glass ceiling is and some of my, um, my suggestions as to how we can um, overcome. And then I will share, you know, my thoughts on what I think helped me to move on. And then we can do the um, how to get on board after that. Yeah, patience. So, yes. Just to, just to add some personal touch to what you're going to share. Um, mm. You had mentioned um, some time about even the full managing director position, how your networks was able to let you know that even yeah, though no, you were I'll acting... Get okay. I'll get there. I actually have it on how I got ahead. So when we get there, I'll talk about it. Yes. So, so, so on, on the glass ceiling, um, we, you know, so I put some definitions together, but my own definition is... For me, it's about choice and, and, and some of the mental, physical, and sometimes structural or organizational obstacles that seem to prevent us from achieving our highest potential. And, and, and the biggest obstacle I have found in my experience is mental, really. You know, whether you, first of all, want to get ahead and whether you believe you know, that you are the, you are the, the candidate for the next high, big job, you know, because I find that a lot of people, when opportunity comes, and, and women especially, you know, they get intimidated and they don't even want to put up their, 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 their hands. So that has been my experience. Of course, there are also other factors, but for me, it's about how we overcome the, 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 the mental um, challenges that prevent us from going as far as we're capable of going. Yeah, so just to bring some humor to, the, 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 the next slide is, is, uh, is actually a short video. Jenna, you, also, you want to play it? And, and, and these are some- You are either too reticent you know, the things that or you are too bossy. In our organization. Yeah, You are carry either on. too reticent or you are too bossy. Worldwide, women hold one in four senior leadership roles. But if we look at who's running the company, just 12% of CEOs are women. So, is business giving women a bad deal? Well, let's look at Silicon Valley, where women hold just one in 10 senior positions. A recent survey of the world's tech powerhouse asked women to reveal their workplace woes and, well, it wasn't pretty. 60% had faced unwanted sexual advances. 65% felt left out from social events because they were a woman. And 84% had been told they were too aggressive. It sounds like, in many cases, women aren't just hitting a glass ceiling. They might also be climbing a broken ladder. Ultimately, women end up quitting tech jobs at yeah. more than double the rate of men. So why is a more balanced boardroom so important? Well, research suggests that companies led by mixed gender teams actually deliver better results. The bottom line is that diversity isn't just about ticking boxes. Frankly, it's just good business sense. And as the chairman of one Fortune 500 company puts it, <clears throat> half the population are female. And if they're not working for me, they're working for someone else. Great. So this was just to inspire you to actually believe that 
you deserve that seat at the table and, and that actually you, you, you bring value to the conversations and to the bottom line. So you must go for it. And we must really change what, what we just saw, you know. I mean, we, we, we've got, it's high time that we went for those rules because it does make business sense. And just to carry on with a bit of the history, I just put it there for information and, and how this um, phenomenon of um, the glass ceiling started, you know, is a bit of history, but we'll move on to the organizational barriers. So just moving on to organizational barriers. Yeah. So there are a lot of barriers. Before the organizational barriers, I'll just share some of the factors that I think account for this glass ceiling. So please go back a, a step and let's share some of the factors. So lots of factors account, individual, and I already talked about the mental and organizational, we've got governmental factors and then the cultural biases. So moving on to the first, organizational barriers. There's still a lot that actually um, works against women when it comes to um, moving to the C-suite or the, the top jobs in organizations. Sometimes even without stating, you know, even age works against, you know, people. And um, women who take time to have families end up um, getting late, you know, um, to the ladder, you know, because sometimes people put their career on hold so they could look, sort out their family. And to, to be honest with you, I mean, we are women, you know, we have a time period that it's easier to have a family. So that tends sometimes to go against us because, be, you know, after you finish having your children and all that, the men have gone ahead already. So that's something that could affect us, some of the, the barriers that really could affect our progression because it's a very competitive environment and nobody waits for anyone. And then, of course, there are also, you know, women tend to be more loyal, you know, I've observed and, and, and I've read several times. So sometimes we tend to remain in roles for too long and actually getting uncomfortable and restless is a good thing, you know, because it kind of sets you, you know, off to your next role. And so I think that's something that we must look out for how long we stay in our roles and we must be eager to move to the next role when the opportunity actually go out there looking for what the next role is you know because one has to be intentional about acquiring the needed experience for where you need to be or where you want to you aspire to get to and then of course There is um, also a lot of women don't network a lot, you know, and in our organizations as well, sometimes, you know, it, it feels like a boys club because there's so many men at the top rules. So when they, are, they get together over drinks, you know, playing golf, et cetera, if you don't take care and you don't make a conscious effort to try and flow with them, you actually feel left out. And that's where the you know, the deals are, are, are signed off, you know. So that's the organizational barrier. Then of course, there's the um, cultural biases. We all know some of the stereotypes. Some of them are actually unconscious biases that we all have. And I always give this example when I'm um, speaking that you'll be surprised. I, I'm a co-founder of two um, professional women's network. I'm really a champion for the cause of women and all that. But without knowing, you know, I still have some biases. I have to, sometimes I have to catch myself, you know. And the example I give is one day I was flying from uh, Dubai to Mauritius. And, you know, flying to Mauritius is over water for hours on end. 
And you know, in the middle of the flight, they announced that, you know, I don't know whether how important they thought that was, but they announced that the pilot and the captain, you know, was a woman, you know, and blah, blah. I can I, I, I kid you not, you know. At first instance, I panicked a bit, you know. And then I caught myself. I'm like, why did you even panic? You know, are you saying that it's not capable? But unconscious bias, that's what I'm talking about. Because sometimes we don't even know we have those biases. And it's something that each and every one of us has to be aware of so that you catch yourself before it translates into taking, you know, the wrong decision about some of these capabilities, you know. And, and of course, there are also things like what society expects from a woman and that in addition to your job, you must make sure that you clean, you do this, you look after the house and all those kinds of things that I expect, domestic work. That is, you are expected to juggle with whatever it is that you are doing in that office, you know. So those are some of the things that may, you know, be barriers and, and to. And, and if you're not determined or if you, 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 do, you don't have the confidence that, you know, you actually deserve to also get ahead in your career and may set you back, you know. So moving on to the last factor, which is... Um, well, the individual um, factor, that's where the imposter syndrome comes in. So fear, I mentioned fear, and then lack of uh, self-determination or ambition, and then not being resilient enough, because really it's a, it's a tough world out there, especially in the tough jobs. You know, there's a lot, shareholders can be brutal, and, 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 and the pressure is actually unrelenting. And a lot of women just think it's not worth it. It's not worth getting a blood, high blood pressure over, you know, a job. And, and many of them just don't think it's worth it. They don't pursue their dreams. And so this is where I, I'll just touch on the imposter syndrome and what it is. So there's a definition, yeah, in, 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 the, in, the, in the next um, slide. And um, it's about not feeling you are up to the task. It's, it's, it's a syndrome that is quite persistent in, in a lot of, especially as women, where we feel that um, our success is not deserved and uh, what, where we are, we don't deserve to be where we are. We, we feel like phonies, you know, we feel it's somebody else should have been there, not me, you know. And it's something that a lot of people fight. I, I must say that, so, so um, Janet, carry on to the next slide, but I must say that with me, you know, I, the, the confidence comes from, I don't know where my, I, I guess I, I, I attribute my confidence to my faith a lot of the times, you know, because my confidence comes from knowing that I can excel at everything I put my hands to do, you know. And frankly, I don't struggle with imposter syndrome. I just need to be honest with you, you know, because my track record just continues to give me confidence to go on to the next thing, you know. And uh, the last factor is with government. There's a lot that governments and uh, policymakers can do. Like in, in some of the European countries, there are quota, quotas for uh, women on boards, et cetera. We are not there. I mean, for some of them, it's 30% at least of board members should be women and all that. We have it, I think there was, um, was it in the manifesto of this present government where they said they were going to ensure that um, they aspire to get 30% of women in important places, but we are a far cry from this aspiration. Yeah. So moving on. So I'll just share some data before I go on um, to how we can overcome the glass ceiling. And on a global scale, you see that Europe um, is doing very well you know, compared, no, well, not doing, yeah, no. France, if you have um, as many, you know, as 44% of women being on boards, 
you've made progress. So Europe is far ahead of um, the rest of, of us, really, uh, with South, South Africa being around the 30% mark for women on boards. And um, we sh- I'll share the data on, on Ghana soon, but you see that <laughs> the likes of uh, Russia, et cetera, and actually some places in, in Asia are, are trailing um, behind, really. They are trailing. So, so just this is the global, I know this is an international audience with old girls all over. So I just thought I'll share the global um, data and then look at the Africa. On, 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 on this page, we're talking about Africa. You see that um, in terms of those doing well. So this chat, okay, just to explain, <laughs> I don't know how many people have phobia you know, for graphs, et cetera. But I think I'll be, I'll I'll just explain, I'll go through what this is. And um, this is about percentage of women CEOs. This Africa, this is an Africa picture. Percentage of women CEOs uh, and then women board directors. So the purplish one is a CEO and then the orange one is the directors. So you see that we have countries like Rwanda, Zambia, Kenya, Ghana, Nigeria, Morocco, South Africa, Tanzania, Egypt, um, Cote d'Ivoire, and Uganda. And countries like Rwanda, because I think Rwanda too is very intentional with opening up for women to take you know, um, influential positions, decision-making roles. So you see that they've done very well, 33%, both for women CEOs and women board directors, you know, which is really higher than the, the, the quotas, the quota that Europe is looking at, at the 30%, you know. And they're actually sustaining this. So something to look, to work towards. Ghana, look at how this looks, it's even embarrassing, you know, 3%, and this is 2019, women directors, this has changed. And then uh, uh, the women CEOs, 8%, you know. So there's really, 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 really a lot of work that all of us collectively, you know, have to do to correct this picture. Because as I mentioned in an earlier, on an earlier slide, it actually makes business sense for women to you know, be at the helm of affairs, be at the decision-making table. I mean, women, a lot in, in many households, women take the decision as to what to buy, when to buy, how much to spend. So if the people making those decisions at the home level are women, why is it that they're not represented at the workplace? So it will be a great idea if those same people decide which products are more suitable, (laughs) you know. And actually businesses will do well because those who buy the stuff will be those that are making the decisions as to what to produce, you know. So yeah, so this is Africa um, boards and then CEOs. And then Ghana. So this is just some um, demographic data, uh, you know, on um, Ghana, which is clear that we are more than 50% of uh, the population. But I'm going to show you figures for um, listed companies. And out of the um, 35 listed companies, um, in, in, in Ghana, how many, how many women are on those boards? You know, it's um, really reducing. And um, you see from the next slides, you know, that only about 25% are female uh, directors or board members are female directors, you know. And then when it comes to non-executive directors, uh, directors that are not part of the management is 27%. You know, and, and that's 2020 data, you know. And 
this so i'm going to show you how the Ghanaian board and, and then the c suite um looks like if you look at chair chairpersons you know boards how many of them are are, are women 15% you know, 85% of boards in Ghana here are chaired by men. Because even when you do get onto boards, you are not, because of unconscious bias, you are not likely to, to be the one chosen, unless the organization is intentional about it, to be the one chosen to be the, the, the chairman. And this is not, by the way, this is not a man problem, eh? Because even women think that women should not be the CEOs or the, the, the chair, you know, uh, uh, the chairman, you know, because without, and, and, and this is something that we should be aware of and do. So I say it not to accuse or anything like that, but I say it so that you are aware that, you know, the, the, the issue starts with us. It's not really out there alone. You know, and we also need to take steps to make sure that we support the process. Because when you, you, you know, there was a, a time I was giving a presentation, I was going to talk to a group of people. And I asked a question. So how many of you actually think that, you know, you, you, how many of you want women bosses? Or how many of you don't want women bosses? A majority of them, they, they raised their hands. You know, somebody says they, they, they find it funny, I say chairman. But, you know, I can say chairperson, chair, whatever, but, you know, the, some of them are designation. It's, it's a designation. It's a, it's a, it's a role, you, you know. And whoever, I don't think, I really don't think, I don't make noise about call me chairwoman or whatever. No. The role is a chairman and it's a woman in the role, you, you, you know. But it depends. Some people take offense and they feel you must make it generic and not gender-specific say chairperson, that's neither here nor there. We just want the people in, in, the, in the roles. And how do we get them there? It starts with the mind is the point I'm saying. And we sometimes are also, you know, um, if you like, I don't want to say guilty, but we must accept some responsibility for not pushing the course forward and not supporting the side. Because you find that, and, and a lot of the times, Actually, the men support us more than women do. And, it, and that's what it is, really. So it's something to be aware of and catch yourself when you find yourself doing that. So there's a lot, all of us, if you look at the CEO roles, 12% compared to 89%, you know, men. Um, if you look at CFO, which is chief finance officer, I mean, can you imagine 4%? And, and, and this is, you know, not the MD role. This is the role, you know, um, the, the, a direct report of the MD. And so few women in there as well, you know. And I must tell you that, that one of the most difficult roles in, in an organization, the CFO, I've, I've been there for um, a number of years, you know, before I moved on. So I can tell you that it's actually really difficult. The kind of, there's so much expected of, of you. You know, running businesses, is about maximizing shareholder returns. And the shareholder at every given turn wants to know what's happening in the business. So you are always trying to, either, either you're reporting what is happening or you are forecasting what will ha happen, you know. So you are always really, really on the move, stress putting numbers together and trying to get everyone to bring their input so that you can meet shareholder expectations. You know, many satisfying many stakeholders across board. So it's a very demanding role, and I'm not surprised that it's only four percent of women that we find there. Because honestly, it involves a lot of personal sacrifice. There've been many times that working as either financial controller, supporting the CFO or a CFO, I've had to stay overnight to deliver a report. You know, I mean, and it's not. It's not, you know, maybe month end. So there's a cycle we have at the month, at the end of the month, there's a lot of reports that you churn out, you know. During those times, you exert a lot of effort and you spend a lot of time in the office. There are very few women who would want to sacrifice 
you know, their, their personal space and their family life to do that. So it takes a lot of sacrifice. And that's why I talk about, you know, mental, your own ambition and your willingness to be able to pay the price, you know, to, for that which you think you have the potential for. And then, of course, the COO is also one of those. So, yeah. So this is just a picture I wanted to paint so that I bring home um, the conversation. And this is more data about when NED, non-executive directors. And by non-executive directors, I mean directors that are not part of management. You know, you find that the ratio, it's better, though, than what you see in the C-suite at, at management level is 27%, but there's still a lot of room um, for improvement. So yeah, please, please move on with it. Uh, yeah, just, just move on. Okay, so this is what I talked about, the benefits. And I think let's just stay here for a minute or so. So it sinks in that, and, and that was the point I was making about, actually women deserve to be in these top jobs and to be on board because it does make business sense. And this is the slide I was looking for, you know, return on equity, which is a measure that um, shareholders hold, to, uh, you know, to heart. They, that, that's their key main focus, really. You know, it's 35% higher. It's is, is been... Um, the research has shown, you know, on boards that have women on, on them. So really the, the case is made, the, 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 the commercial imperative is, is quite strong. We just need to go for the jobs, you know, and the opportunities, um, you know, that diversity brings as well, you know, are all um, stated here on this um, uh, slide. So just to give some, commercial perspective to how beneficial it is for women to be in this, these top management roles. Okay, so just carrying on quickly. Yeah, so yeah, so now to my, my uh, yeah. Okay. So now to how I think, um, and you know, I say this with a lot of humility that I actually believe that there's a lot of grace, you know, working in my life as well. And my steps are being ordered and um, it's about purpose. So this is not a prescription and this is not um, a rule, if you like, and it's, it's just me sharing what I think has worked for me. And I just think that it should be taken in that light because I'm very, very conscious of the fact that there are many who may even be better than me who are not in the role. So, yeah. So just a few things about having this ambition. So it starts really from you, the goal, you know, to be where you think your potential can take you, you know, and, and for me, it, even though um, early in my career, I didn't know that I'll be managing director, you know, as time went on, I just gave everything I did my best shot, really. And I looked forward to the next rule. I look forward to progression all the time. So I had a goal, I set a goal. This year, when the year started, I did my plan and you know, have a goal as to how I'll progress. It takes actually being intentional and putting things on paper and visualizing where you see yourself in the next year, next two years, next three years, four, five years, and even in the long term, where do you see yourself? And you break down you know, um, into shorter time periods and put actions that you can actually measure. Personal, hold yourself personally accountable um, for, for what you need to do to fill the gaps that you've identified 
are, are keeping you from moving to your next role. You know? And by nature, I'm actually very focused and determined. And um, over the years, I've become very resilient. You know, so I, um, I, I can, I go through challenges and like everyone else, you know, um, but I don't allow them to put me down. You know, I, I try to bounce back and, and go for it, you know. So I, I've, I've just, I'm just tenacious by nature and, and it's worked for me, you know. And, and, then, and then of course, I always go for things that I believe that um, I want and uh, that I don't settle. I, and I told, I gave you that example of uh, when there was an opportunity for a finance director back in Barclays Bank, no, sorry, Barclays, in Standard Chartered Bank. Um, and I was told that, oh, I didn't have experience in uh, banking experience, you know, and that uh, my boss said he didn't want a, a number cruncher. I was like, okay, let me go get what you say you want, you know. So I didn't just say, oh yeah, they don't like me. Blah. A lot of people just personalize things. I find that it's very debilitating, you know, to personalize things. Assume that is not about you, you know, and take up the challenge, you know. Because I also find that, and I haven't been preoccupied, by the way, you know, as I progressed along the line, the whole idea of being a woman was for me really very far from my mind. I just focused on delivery. When I say that, but I just say it, that's my experience. It was later on, you know, when I, I, I took the senior job that people feel, felt inspired and were like, how did you manage it amongst all the, amidst all the, you know, um, discrimination? And, and, the, and I was like, trust you. Uh, trust me, I did not think that anyone discriminated against me along the way. I didn't even feel it. I just focused on delivery. And for me, even in the workplace, when I get into the office, I don't think man, woman. I think deliver results. How do we get this done? So if the results are coming from a woman, I want you on the team. If they are coming from a man, I want you on the team. I just want people who will, I can rally around you know, for us to go for it and achieve the vision. And my focus when I get to an environment is to deliver, you, you, you know. So with, with that, you know, I, because I wasn't so conscious about being female and how, you know, and all these barriers, for some reason, my results just worked for me. They just translated into people wanting me to, to be on their team and wanting, and, and giving me the opportunity to take that promotion to that next job, you know. So I think for me, if I, I were to advise up and coming young women, I'd say, don't be so preoccupied or occupied with the idea of being a woman in the workplace. Because actually that could, first of all, intimidate you. That could, you know, get you focusing on things that you must be ignoring because there are some things that are more important than others that could actually distract you, you know, from the main thing, which is delivering and proving that you bring value to the, 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 the organization or you bring value to, to, to the team, you, you, you know. And, and the, the less we, we, we get preoccupied with, you know, that, you know, the, the better or, or the more, you know, um, we can, really maximize our, our, our potential. And that has been my experience. And of course, it's, um, how you balance family and, and, and work is also very, very critical to um, sustained uh, progress, especially at the top. And then of course, I have a few more suggestions around you know, how you can. So the next slide, please. So you know, I talk about your current role being your next, being the key to your next, and how it's important to exceed expectations every time you are given an opportunity. And really, you know, as I told you, when I started off, 
I really wasn't thinking that, even though I wanted to progress, even though I wanted to um, maximize my potential, I didn't know whether that potential was uh, CFO, which is like the top job in the finance world, or MD. All I knew was that, you know, I just wanted to be the best that I could be, you know, in, in the corporate environment. So I gave every assignment, you know, I was given my best shots and exceeded expectation. And I, I did tell you that on two occasions, my bosses recommended me. So my boss moved on and said, she can do the job. <laughs> you know, I need, you know, a new challenge. Let her take my job, you know. And I, I didn't have to go through any interview. I just got the job. You know? So really, and sometimes actually, you might not like the job you are doing. So, you know, my finance experience I was in the finance world for a long time. Look, it was a difficult experience. And if you ask me, you know, when I, I, I became managing director, I actually got an opportunity. There was an international organization that was recruiting for um, finance director. It was one of these United Nations, blah, blah, you know, organizations. And they wanted a group a finance director, which... It's actually it's an international job, so it's actually a big job, you know. But the whole idea of going back to do finance, I'm like, nah, 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 I've paid my dues. It's too hard, you know. I'm not going back. Even though that's not, you know, my preference, whilst I was in the role, you would have thought I was having a party. I gave it my best shot. I was very passionate about it. I exceeded expectation. I put in the work. I stayed late because I realized that I was building, you know, um, my profile and acquiring the diversified experience and, and making myself versatile, you know, and, and versatility, by the way, is key to getting the top job, the MD role, you know, and all that, uh, you know, was filling my, my, my reservoir, if you like, you, you know. So it, it was hard work, but I gave it my best shot because I reckoned it was the key to what ultimately I wanted to be, you know? So it's that realization. Sometimes you may not like the job you're doing, but to the extent that you feel that it counts in helping you acquire, you know, uh, the, the diversity, you know, that is um, in terms of skills and uh, experiences that you need, you know, for a bigger job, I think you should give it, don't complain, don't, you know, because if you complain and you get distracted, so you will not be able to focus and excel in the role. So it's really important that your current role, remember, is your key to your next role. And then it's about taking risk as well. Even my, my leaving Barclays, a comfortable, high profile role, and taking a role in a smaller organization that I was recruited to grow in a, an industry I knew nothing about. I, sometimes I wonder what I, whether, I, as they say, what I've smoked. What, what, what did you smoke against? Because sometimes I, I, I pinch myself and I'm like, okay, you know, you really can take some risk. But at the time, I'm very convinced. So I take, I, I, I just take that leap of faith because I'm somebody who is visionary. I can see the picture of how things have the potential to be, you know. So when I took that job, I saw what could become of Hollard, you know. And I, I, I made the move because I really liked the purpose of the organization. The purpose, our purpose as Hollard is to um, enable more people to create and secure a better future. You know, I like, and we, we had... Um, and we, we say we do well by doing good, you know. So I thought I really wanted, to, it's a, a totally purpose-driven organization. You know, we go about everything, you know, with, with our purpose at the back of our minds, you know. And for me, I'd gotten to that point in my life where I felt that I wanted to do something significant. I wanted to be a catalyst for positive change. And, and, and leave a legacy, you know, that I could be proud of, you know. And, and, and so that pushed me, 
really to take um, the, 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 the role. And as I said, three years down the line, I think it was one of the best decisions that I took because even though the first couple of years were tough, I mean, uh, you can imagine, now, you know, all the hard work that we put in um, over the last three years is um, obviously translating into progress and growth, you know, and, 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 and I'm very happy that I made that decision. But if I didn't have, you know, a risk taker um, orientation or, or, or posture, I wouldn't have been able to make this decision. I would have just said, ah, let me just be comfortable where I am. And, and, and take it from there, you know. And then the, another risk that I took was when I, 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 I went to South Africa, you know, I, I left, then I went to South Africa. It, you know, South Africa, for those of you who are working in South Africa, you can know, I'm sure you know that it's not a very easy environment to work in, you know, with, uh, there's a lot of, now it's, it's more subtle, but before then, sometimes it could be quite overt, you know, in terms of the discrimination, people thinking, where is she also coming from West Africa and all that, you know, but I, I decided to give myself, you know, that opportunity, that kind of exposure, the much needed international exposure, which also worked again, worked in my favor because you soon see how key that is, you know, if you want to be considered for um, big jobs, you know, uh, for the top job, especially, and for more senior roles. Sometimes you need to demonstrate that you can actually thrive outside your comfort zone and it involves taking risk, you know. So that's just two examples, but many times in my career, I've had to take risk. And I realized that without taking risk, you, you, you limit, you know, um, the opportunities that you can take advantage of. And as I say, your comfort zone is your cage, you know. And, uh, your line manager is your default sponsor. You know, oftentimes I have these conversations with people and they're like, oh, I don't have anyone. And, you know, everyone, you know, you need a sponsor and nobody is sponsoring me. And I'm like, okay, so what's your, how is your relationship with your line manager? They're like, oh, you know, it's, uh, sometimes they complain about them. And I'm like, you don't have the luxury of not getting on well with your line manager. If there's a problem, you better fix it because you'll be surprised how often they get the opportunity to either recommend you or, 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 or not. You know, you'll be surprised at how many people looking for somebody in a certain role go back to your organization to ask your line manager whether they should take you on, you know. So, and I have had the um, experience where my line managers the people I've worked with have been the ones that have recommended me for roles. I remember when I was going to um, Standard Chartered in, in, in South Africa, uh, I told you I was in the corporate department. I didn't have to do anything to get the role that I got. I, I got an email one day, you know, I'd gotten to that time that, you know, I was like, oh, I need to move, I need to move again, you know. And then I got an email from somebody, my boss, he became my boss, you know, by that time he wasn't my boy. He, he wrote and said, oh yeah, I'm looking for somebody for the financial controller role and you come highly recommended, you know? And I found out later that one of the, my bosses that I'd worked with was the one that recommended me, you know? So if I, I hadn't worked well with him, if I hadn't um, supported him, and when I work with people, especially my bosses, I try to make them shine as much as possible. That is another key. There are a lot of people who don't get it, you know. There are very few people who, when you support for them to get ahead, will forget you. In the work environment, that has been my experience. When I am working with people, especially my bosses, I try to make them shine as much as possible. And that is why when I went to South Africa, my boss could say, I'm moving on and told the MD, she can do my job, let her take over, you know. When I also, you know, back in, in, in Ghana, when the MD who was um, my, my boss at the time, when I was finance director, was going away, he recommended that I acted whilst they looked for the right person to do the job, you know. So really, you, you must get to 
a point where in your team you are sure that when you are not there, even when you are not around and conversations are being had, your boss will recommend you. You, you know, and you get you get there when it's very clear that you've worked hard in pushing um, your boss ahead. You know, a lot of people want to always be recognized. Oh, yeah, I, I did this and I am doing the work and my boss is getting the glory. Don't worry, your time will come. If you do it diligently enough and consistently enough, there'll be a time that your boss will move on and you and you will be the natural person that will take over. Or there'll be another opportunity somewhere and you will say, oh, I can vouch for this person. Because let me tell you, however good you are, eh, no matter how good you are, if nobody recommends you, you are getting nowhere. And that's another truth, another fact that we need to come to terms with. Somebody has to say you are good before you get that job or you even get a foot in the door. Somebody has to say, I'm a witness. This person can do this. And who better than the person you work directly with, your boss. So please, that's one relationship you must never joke with. And then I talk about grit as well. I've already talked about how you have to persevere, be resilient. And I share some, some of the difficult times that we had in uh, Barclays. I mean, there was a time that I, I even thought I was going to get fired. We lost some big money, you know. Frankly, for me, uh, we were not the only bank that lost it. Quite a, a number of banks had given money to the same person and we couldn't recover it. So millions of, you know, dollars at the time. But by the grace of God, we bounced back and the next, re next year's results were outstanding. So obviously that erased that record, you know. So, the, you know, the, the ability to bounce back. And when I took over Pollard as well, I mean, the first two years, last 2020 was a tough year for me. Actually, you know, I ended 2020. And I say it because when you're inspiring people, you have to let them know it's not, you know, a piece of cake. And in spite of that, you don't throw in, you know, the towel just because of a few challenges. At the end of 2020, you know, <laughs> I actually felt like just coiling in bed and covering myself and not doing, I mean, I just wanted to resign, honestly, you know, because we had worked so hard, as I said, the market was tough. It's a tough industry. It, the bottom line was not reflecting the hard work. And I just thought, huh. Maybe I should just, what's all this, you know? But I, I, end, I entered 2021 with some vim, I guess, through prayer and everything, you know, that just set off the business to a great start, you know? And 2021 was a great, a really, really great year for the business, you know? So you go through those and you have to be conscious of it. You have to be prepared you know, and be able to continue to forge ahead in spite of the obstacles, because I promise you, I promise you, they will come, you know. And then, of course, skills that you, have, you also have to be aware of, the skills that you need for where you want to get to. And if you want to get onto a board, if you want to get into top management, and then some of the skills you have to be able to, you know, uh, prepare, uh, prepare, and implement a strategy, I mean, a winning strategy, winning from, you know, because you'll be told what your mandate is by the shareholder, whoever appointed you, you'll be given targets and you need a winning strategy to be able to deliver on those targets. And so you need to know how to go about it, you know. And then of course, there are other skills like leadership. You work with people, a lot of the, the work that I do at that level is with people, whether it's with clients, customers, staff, the regulator, governments, whoever, it's all about people. It's all about how do you lead people? How do you influence? You know, how do you bring people along? How do you identify talented people? How do you optimize, you know, their talent, you know, to, to, to deliver on the expectations of all the important stakeholders, you know? So there's a lot that um, of people management, of leadership that you need to bring, um, um, to, to, uh, to the role, really. And then there are also uh, uh, specialized um, uh, uh, 
like or technical you know expertise like if finance it and what have you that sometimes come um, in very handy when it comes to um, some senior level jobs as well as board roles and uh, attitude 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 you know you'll be very surprised at, at how many people you know get um that that get jumped over or get that are not selected because they may be good in terms of um you know aptitude but their attitude sucks you know and because of that they they, they, they are past you know uh, whoever is looking for somebody just doesn't choose them you know so and, and and one of the things that i worked for me was sometimes as i said i paid honestly i i paid a lot of a high price to get where i am i need to confess to you some of the sacrifices um you know so for example you have to if you are working with me when i talked about uh, covering your boss's back make sure your boss shines you know and all that sometimes you do it at a high cost you you give you know um you give a, a picture of being always available reliable committed you know having ownership a can do spirit it it can come at very great personal sacrifice you know because for example you know there's something that needs to be done on monday and it's it's got to be done right sometimes you have to work on on sunday so here's my 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 pa supporting me with this you know very clearly you can you know you can see that this is a go getter this is somebody with the right attitude this is somebody i can tell you i'm not you know a prophet but i see somebody who get far when i see somebody who knows what to do to help meet the boss's objective you see what i'm saying i'm just giving you a practical real life you know um on the spot example for you to see what a can do reliable ownership you know attitude to life can do for you in your career it can only get you ahead you know and then of course always delivering and focusing on execution is really 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 key and then to what um the question that betha wanted me to 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 answer on on um uh, you know, so on when when I when when I became acting managing director for Barclays, which was in April 2013, I, I was doing the role for six months. Before then, before you know, I I just taken over as acting managing director. Before I got appointed into the role, you know, I didn't really want to initially. I was like, ah, oh, this role. You know, they'll probably go and bring somebody from outside, and because I didn't want to set myself up to be disappointed. So initially, I was like, "Yeah, I'll just be a caretaker, and whoever they want to bring, they can bring, and all that." So when I got the opportunity, I was chatting with uh, somebody really important. I, I don't want to mention, you know, who the person is, at, but in all the decision making and all that, somebody really important. I was chatting with them, and. Um, it, it was clear from my conversation that I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm just taking care of the, you know, position and I'm aware that they're going to bring other people. And it almost felt like I didn't want the job for, and, and somebody had been observing me, you know, when I had that conversation with this person who was also very key and um, one of the final voices in, in, in who got the role and felt that I had missed an opportunity to sell myself and tell him that I actually wanted the role. She was actually aghast. So later on, she called me and said, what are you doing? Don't you think that every conversation from now onwards is an interview? Don't you realize that? Why didn't you indicate your interest in the role and tell the person that you give it your best shot and all that, and you acted like you really didn't want the role? You know, don't mess up this opportunity. It's one in a million, you know? And she, she had that conversation with me because 
she felt that she needed to mentor me. You know, she was previous to some of the things that were happening and she felt that, no, no, I'm not going to allow this person to miss this opportunity. And she did that because th there was that relationship, you know, because she didn't have to do it. You understand? So back again to relationships because you, you things happen and sometimes you wonder, should I tell you know, the people involved, you also don't want to, because of confidentiality, you don't want to go and say what happens around and all that, but you also want to give people heads up and give them the opportunity to, to make amends or to change their ways if it's something that may cost them. If you see what I'm saying, you know, you can only take that risk if you have a close relationship with the person. And it's important that we realize that. And another, when I say ask for a seat at the table and meaning. So I was doing the role, after that advice, I decided to really go for it and do the role with all my might. I was doing it and naively thought that because I was doing the role so well, when it was time to recruit for the role, I would be included in the process and be taken through the interviews and, you know, and be given a chance, really. Apparently, it wasn't even in the mind of, you know, <laughs> the, the recruiting manager, the, the, the boss, the Africa CEO, the one, the, 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 the one who was looking after all the other CEOs in all the different African countries. It wasn't even in his mind to add me because apparently, you know, Ghana is a big part of the Africa um, business. So it was seen as too precious, too big to be given to a first time CEO. Mind you, be, before I started acting, I was CFO, I was finance director, I hadn't done the MD role before. So they thought he didn't want to take a chance. He was looking for an existing managing director, an existing CEO to come and take over Ghana because there were, people, there were CEOs in smaller countries who would have loved to, to take over Ghana. And there were also others were outside who would have loved to run backlist in Ghana. And the last person he was thinking about was somebody like me who hadn't been a CEO before running the country. So he didn't even include me in the shortlist. So I was thinking, oh yeah, I'm doing such a great job. And you know, I became the opportunity. Oh, I was not even in the running, you know. But again, relationship. So I was. Uh, you know, having a chat with uh, somebody. And then the person was like, um, are you interested in the role? I said, yeah, yeah. Why, why do you ask that? Well, because your name is not on the short list, you know. So if you are interested, you better tell them you are interested so that they can include you. And I'm like, what? And she, she ended up saying that if you don't say it now, they may go and bring somebody and you hate yourself because it's like, you know this is something you can do and somebody else has gotten there, you know? So I was like, how do I go about it? Well, tell them why they must include you in the shortlist. And I'm like, how do I do that? Because it involves self-promotion. I'm like, I've never really done that before. How do I tell them how great I am and all that? She's like, put something on paper and just give a justification. Show them your track record and what, you know, so far when you took over, what you've achieved, you know, put it in writing and send it to them. So I did exactly that, you know, and I sent it to the recruiting manager in, in South Africa. Immediately, I got a response. After reading it, he came back and said, thank you for this, because frankly, I wasn't going to include you in the short list, but you've given me reason to. So I'm going to add you to the list of, you know, those going through the process, and then um, let's see where that takes us. The rest is history, really, but I must say that it was, a rigorous interview. I haven't had any such a rigorous. I went through what they call an assessment center where they do all sorts of psychometric testing, you know, layers of interviews. And at the end, I thank God that, you know, I, I, I came at tops, you know, uh, through all the process and I was appointed in the role. And um, to the glory of God as well, you know, my performance in the role justified um, at the appointment. So I need you to understand that sometimes things that, you know, you want or you think 
um, you have the potential for, don't always come on a silver platter. Sometimes, and I'm sure oftentimes, you have to lean in, you have to ask for that opportunity and that place at the table and justify it because it's not going to come, you know, to you easy. So that, that's it. And then just moving on quickly, quickly, quickly. Yeah, to the next slide. Yeah, I saw that. Yes, self-promotion is sometimes okay. I know uh, culturally and all that, a lot of us feel that, oh yeah, modesty. We are taught to be modest. Oh, don't blow your own horn, blah, blah. But in a corporate environment, hey, if you don't say, there's a lot of show and tell that happens there. If you are not one of those that can show what you're doing and, and how you can add value and how you, why you must be considered, I can tell you that you'll be, you'll be ignored. Honestly, a lot of the times you'll be ignored because there'll be many others and especially men do that better than women, you know, and that's something that we can learn as ladies. And then um, this is um, on breaking the glass ceiling and how um, I, I think we can overcome this imposter syndrome. I said, for me, you know, I haven't really had to deal with that, but how I think um, I've been able to overcome this is always being authentic, really. And, and I keep telling myself that I don't have to pretend to be what I'm not. You know, obviously, when people give you the opportunity, they know who you are. You don't have to pretend to be somebody else. So bring your whole self, you know, who you are to the, the, the role. I remember, you know, as, as managing director for, for, for Barclays, going to, to speak to some young people and then somebody, one of them. So after we had finished late, late girls, you know, one of them ran and followed me and she was just like, Oh, I like you. And I'm like, really? And I smiled at her. She said, no, you are normal. <laughs> I, just, I love her. I said, what do you mean? She said, Oh no. I mean, I think she expected somebody who would be like, Oh, you know, high and mighty, whatever. But I was there laughing with them being girlish and giggling and being normal and myself. And if I found something funny, I didn't pretend it wasn't funny because I was empty, you know, that kind of thing. And she said she could relate to me. So she was like, oh, you know, I, I can actually relate to you because she went, they probably thought that our managing director is like somebody like you, you won't be able to relate to, you know, so I'm just myself really. And so, sometimes people used to be surprised because for example, if I want to eat and I want to eat kinky, I, I used to like kinky fish and pepper a lot, you know, these days. We're all watching our weight, but you know, if maybe we're, we're having something and a kinky fish and pepper, oh, I'll wash my hand and use my fingers. I'm telling you, because I really want to enjoy the kinky. You know, and people will be like, wow, you know, somebody, I remember somebody remarked and said, wow, I mean, this is really inspiring because I mean, I would have thought that, but now that I see you do it, and then you find that everyone has washed their hands and they're also eating their kinky the way they want to eat it. I'm just myself. And it just, prevents, you know, any feeling of, oh, yeah, so maybe, you know, I'm not so good, you know, this is me and I still got the job, so, you know, and then um, about, uh, I think humility, humility is also recognizing that you don't know everything, uh, you're still learning, ask questions, there'll be people, there'll be, there's always somebody who knows more than you, not being bashful, not being, you know, uh, not hesitating to, to say, you know, you, you, you don't know this and, and giving pain people um, their due respect, respecting people and acknowledging their contribution, you know, will, will get you over whatever limitations you, you think that you have. So really, and also focusing on others, because sometimes we get too preoccupied with us, 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 us. You know, the more you focus on other people, the, 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 the more the attention and the focus gets off you. So that feeling of me, 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 I'm in the spotlight, you know, just diminishes if you like. And then of course, I also approach everything with passion and enthusiasm. And I find that my passion and enthusiasm is infectious. So even if I'm not sure of something and I, I, I'm so enthusiastic and passionate about almost everything that, I mean, people believe that I, I know what I'm doing, you know, so really, you know, that then, carries them along and we all rally together to, to do what needs to be done. And then of course, I also think that preparation, 
Preparation is also very, very key, you know. And um, so, for example, before I came to speak to you all, we took time to prepare, even though I have done this several times and I, I, I have, you know, um, I have the notes in my head. I had to put them down, I had, I had to present them in a certain way, you know, and, and all that. So preparation really, please don't go into anything unprepared. You will just be completely flustered and, and, and you know, I, and I learned that a few times when I, when I took over. I recall, you know, when I became managing director, there's a lot of, by the way, speaking engagement when you take over, when you do the CEO role. I mean, you're always speaking as, to somebody publicly, public speaking, you know. And there was this day I'd just taken over for, for some reason. I don't know whether they were trying to see whether I could do the job. Like, you, you, you've gotten the job. Let's see whether you can do Oh, so back-to-back -back engagements. And, you know, I didn't take time to also get a, somebody who could manage my time, you know, well, you know. So they had just flooded my whole uh, diary and everything. There was so much speaking yet. This, this, and there were visitors that come from South Africa. So I really didn't have time to prepare for a particular, you know, event that I had to speak at. And, and I got somebody to do that most of the time for me to deliver. Well, even when you give me the information, I have to rewrite it so that it can flow, it can come from me, you know. I didn't have time to do that that day because they're just back to back in everything. And somebody had put down a speech for, for me. So it was too late and it was like 10 minutes to the time when I realized that the first, it was rubbish, honestly, because some of them couldn't even, <laughs> I mean, they, they, didn't, they didn't even flow. It wasn't coherent, you know, reading flow. So God, I'm, I just panicked, you know, and even before I, I got on stage, I could, I was feeling like, ah, oh, this thing. And then so when I got on stage, I was like, okay, so why don't I deliver this thing off the cuff? And I tried to, well, that was the worst decision. I mean, I, it was so bad, you know, and it was a less, it was, a, I felt bad, you know. And the person who put the thing together to was like, oh, but I gave you a I'm like, nonsense, this was no speech, you know. But anyway, I'm sharing this because sometimes, you know, we, we all have these bad experiences and it boils down to a lesson learned. Preparation, preparation, preparation. And of course, the growth mindset, always being aware that you must be learning and you don't know any, I mean, by the time we are done learning, we are about to exit the world, you know. So having that mindset can keep you, you know, recognizing that you are actually not expected to know everything. So don't feel like you're an, an imposter in the role. And of course, consistently delivering because, you know, that boosts your confidence. If you have a track record of exceeding expectations in your roles, you then gain confidence to be able to do the next role. And that, that is what has really helped me. And my faith really, really crowns it all. So that's my little bit on how we can overcome the imposter syndrome. So, so just moving on to I'm sure the last slide or so, those would be just... Um, how organizations can do their parts. If there are any HR leads here, perhaps you want to take note of some of the things that we've put down about, about uh, creating the right culture and, 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 and environment and all that. And then how we can use networking, et cetera, um, within the organization to be able to bring up a, a lot of the people that have potential, but you know do, are not, um, you know, in the right uh, networks, if you like, and therefore do not get noticed or do not have people who can recommend them because they are not known. And it helps to inculcate a networking um, approach in organizations to, to, to um, some of the development plans that we put together for people must include how they can leverage internal networks Etc. You know, so these are some of uh, the ideas that we have. I'm sure we can easily share this for those who are interested in trying to implement this in their various organizations. And then on board, back onto how we can get on board, and I'll round up with that. So, so for me, what has worked has been. First of all, and, and I have here prepared board ready CV, but I, I'll get to it. You know, 
What has worked has been my track record of excellence uh, in senior management roles, because that just opens up opportunities for you um, because you've demonstrated that you can um, succeed at the highest level in organizations and people want what you have on their boards, you know, and, and really for some of the best opportunities come when you are headhunted, when you're trying, struggling to let everyone know that, oh, I need, I need a board room, I need a board room. I mean, oftentimes you really don't get any good board, honestly, you know, people have to come fetch you, look for you because they, they want what you have. And how will they know what you have when you've demonstrated that, you know, you know what you're about. You, you can actually succeed, you know, as CEO. You've succeeded in the role as CEO or CFO or any of the, the C roles. So an excellent track record really plays um, an invaluable part in you getting on onto boards. And I found that is helped. So wherever you are, just build that track record. So that when we are looking for somebody like one of the best CFOs, your name will come up in the country. I mean, and, and another, so that the next thing that worked for me is a great uh, social media presence in, in the professional, especially LinkedIn. You know, people should look at your profile and contact you and say your profile matches this job, you know. And you must not just be there like uh, passive or, or your present dormant, but actively writing, commenting, you know, getting involved in, in topical issues, etc. So that the, 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 the networking, the social media, the LinkedIn world, for example, will know you, you know, and recruiters, there's so many recruiters on there. And I can tell you that being visible um, on social media, LinkedIn especially, has not only helped me, you know, to to, to be where I am, it actually, there was a recruiter, a, a recruiter reached out to me for this role via LinkedIn, you know, through LinkedIn, they dug in and, 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 and found more about me and decided that I was a good match for this role. You know? So really you cannot, if you want to get ahead, you cannot not be on LinkedIn. It's just a cardinal sin, professional sin, you know, not to be actively on LinkedIn and, and to be recognized for your expertise, you know, and boards tend to also, for example, when, when I, I, I left Barclays and I, and I came here, I mean, a number of, before I got on the, after I got on to, and before I got on the Ecobank board, a number of banks reached out to me and, and asked me whether I wanted to be on their boards, you know, so really this, and then also being visible generally, accepting public speaking, so I accept one of the reasons, of course, apart from the fact that I love you all ladies, you know, and all that, and I want to inspire as many people as possible. Another reason is this is a, a great public speaking opportunity. Who knows what's on this call? Who's on this call? I beg your pardon. You see what I'm saying and what can come up after this. So I, I try not to miss <laughs> a lot of opportunities, you know, to share and, and be out there. And you get quoted a lot in the papers and you are out there all over you know, being visible. And that's just creating, um, you know, the opportunity for you to, to get that next role, you know. So very, so write, those of you who are not writing, start writing, you know, for anything, any paper at all, you know, and being out there offering your expertise and being known for it, you know. And then of course, um, international experience also counts. And that's why it's important you know, to take that leap of faith and get out of your comfort zone to another country. And, you know, if you're in a, a, a multinational organization, the opportunity does come up for you to take that role in that other country. A lot of women will say, oh, my family, blah, blah, blah. Yes, family is important. And I, I confess to you that when I went, I struggled and I had to come back, but I did go, you know, I did go. So I think you must take that opportunity when it comes up to work in another jurisdiction because it only diversifies your, um, your, your um, international experience and gives you the needed exposure, you know, which is critical for the top job, you know. So, um, yeah. So I talked about being well-known for expertise in, 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 in a particular 
um, field as well. It also plays a good role. So when I was approached to be on the EcoBank board, one of the main reasons was, how, of course, apart from being um, uh, you know, a previous CEO of a bank, you know, a high-performing bank, you know, I was uh, also um, shortlisted because of my finance, my strong finance background, because they needed, and it worked that I was a woman, because they needed another woman on the board and with the right skills, you know, and I had the skills they were looking for, because I'm, I'm, I'm currently the chairman or the, the chairperson <laughs> of the audit committee, you know, an audit committee, you need to be an accountant, very grounded in accounting finance. So my expertise in accounting finance played a part in addition to having been CEO of a bank in being headhunted for the role of Ecobank non-executive director. And it was the same really with um, my Haptel board membership where they were looking for a seasoned um, CEO of a bank because they had just started being regulated by the central bank and, and they, they needed somebody who knew what they, they needed to, to do, who knew what to do, you know, um, to, to keep the organization in, in good standing and all that. So, yeah, so all the expertise that you acquire along the line, sometimes, you know, once people um, get to know um, you for that kind of expertise, um, sets you up. To, to be, um, if you like, um, to, for, for, um, to be headhunted, you know, uh, for specific. So handpicked was the word I was looking for, for setting board or top management rules. And then, of course, I, yeah. So what, what helps, you know, in addition to what my own personal experiences, which I, I've just shared, what helps is also to have prior evidence or experience on boards. And oftentimes people just want to be on boards, just want to jump and be on a board. But it doesn't just, just like how people ask for work experience, people to ask for board experience. And you can sometimes show that when you volunteered. So it's not every board job that is paid. You, sh- you can start by volunteering. I'm sure there's a lot of opportunity to be on committees at church. For example, and if you can show that you are you are on board in maybe church or some other informal you know arrangement or even other organizations like Rotary and all those kinds of things that people join, where you can play you you've played either a, a leadership role or a board role, and you were not paid a volunteer you know opportunity, and you've done that that, that you have a proven uh, you know uh, track record if you like, you, you know, in those volunteer roles. That sets you up, up very nicely, you know, for maybe getting on to say a non an, an NGO role, non-profit organization, which may not be as high paying as if you were, went onto a commercial board, you know. And then from there, that then opens up doors for you for, for um, a membership of, of a commercial board. You know, so really, uh, no, it, it, it's not that easy, uh, except that you've played executive roles. So I, before I became a non-executive director of Ecobank and um, Haptel, I was executive director a number of years. As finance director, I was on the board of Barclays. As executive director for finance, as managing director, I was a board member. So I've been on the board in my executive capacity for a long time. So that actually, you know, helps you. It gives you a head start on getting onto boards, you know, as a non-executive director. However, if you haven't had my type of experience, I think your best bet is to, you know, make it up, you know, acquire it by volunteer work and being on smaller and paid uh, boards of non-profit organizations, because that can then give you the needed experience for when the right opportunity comes up. And then, of course, always having a board ready CV. Oftentimes, people come to you and say, oh, I want a board role, you know, that blah, blah, blah. But when you ask them for a CV, they don't have a board ready CV, you know. And a board ready CV is different from 
like wanting a job in an organization. Because when, when you want to be uh, a, a top, you part of the top management in a, an executive role, you your board, your, your sorry, your CV has all your experiences, chronological, all your, uh, 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 what's the qualifications as, you know. But when you're doing a board specific CV, you have to tell people what value you bring to the board. So it's the format and the arrangement is very different. You know, a, a, a board um, ready CV is like a pitch, you know, in one page, I must be convinced that you are the right candidate and you bring value to um, the board and to the organization by being punchy about why I'm your best bet for this board. You know, so if you want to be on the board, by now you should have had a pager that is a knockout, you know, an elevator speech, yes, that's it, you know, yeah. You know, so you must have it ready on a one page, ready for to, to give to whoever is looking. And that's a board ready CV. And in addition to that, you must be part of some professional networks. I mean, for example, I'm part of Executive Women Network, I'm part of International Women Network. You know, I do get the opportunity to recommend people. And I look at my network, people in my network, because, and even in my network, it's not, I don't know a lot of people. people Actually, think because we're all in this neck, I should recommend you. No, I need to know you because I'm putting my neck on the line. You know, so those relationships we must take pains to develop, especially if it's you looking for board rules. Fine, I mean, we all need to make an effort to get to know people and all that. But you, you have, you want, you know, more out of the relationship. Let me put it that way. So if you're looking for a board membership role, you don't have any business not trying to get to know people and nurture really and cultivate relationship. You must. First of all, get onto those professional, you know, um, associations. And then secondly, get to know people and especially people who are already on boards and let them know of your intention that I actually want to be on a board so that when the opportunity comes, they can um, um, recommend you, you know, because the opportunity does come. I mean, on many occasions, people have reached out to me to say, First of all, are you interested? I'm like, no, my hands are full. Okay, can you recommend somebody? You know, but I should be able to recommend. So sometimes they ask for a specific skill set, you know, and I look around my net, I'm like, okay, who has these uh, particular, you know, sets of skills? Who can I recommend? You know, and I do that a few times. Sometimes I don't even know who to recommend. So it's important that if you're looking for those roles, you let people who are already board members know, and you, you let them know what skills you bring, you know, um, to, to the organization. So that for me, it's um, in a nutshell, really, um, how I think that we can work towards um, our aspirations of getting on, on, on boards. And uh, just to close it, yeah, so moving on, Janet, just to close it, Okay, so you can see a few people. You, you all know Lu Lucy. So you, Jackie uh, looks after um, Enterprise. She's not an old girl of Wesley Girls, but I just put a few ladies here doing really, really great stuff. Um, Ghanaian ladies doing great stuff that can inspire you that, listen, if we all have done it, you too can really, and you must by all means go for it. So Lucy Quist, many of us know, Angela Chairman Ting, many of us know. Um, Lucy and uh, Angela are Wesley Girls girls. Abna Osepuk is also a Wesley Girls girl. And uh, the others are not Wesley Girls girl, uh, girls to my knowledge, but also doing great stuff in their field. So if they can do it, what's stopping you? I think I'll end on that note. So thank you all for your rapt attention. I hope it was useful. Yeah, these are, and you see Hannah there. Hannah is an old girl as well. So Hannah doing great stuff out there as well and really inspiring. So once again, thank you so much for your kind attention and for the opportunity. Yeah, so to questions. 
All right. Um, Patience, you were on a roll. I think you've been speaking for probably an hour and a half nonstop. Oh, dear. No, you but it's good. totally bored. No, 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 no. It's good because we were making comments and writing things down and you were just dropping pearls and there was no reason to stop the <laughs> pearls from the gold nuggets, the gold nuggets from dropping. And so we just had well. to let you on the roll i mean it's been amazing there have been comments on youtube and oh, on the wow. site really really have inspired us and i think even after this more people are going to be watching and i would have to um ask everybody's indulgence and have to extend this for maybe another 20 minutes or so so we can answer even if it means just 10 questions otherwise we will get nothing answered you know, we don't want this to be didactic. I think we would get a lot more if we're able to pierce through and ask you some questions. So first of all, a big, big thank you. Um, and even though you've told us about your career, just the way you even prepared for this, we thought we were just gonna sit you down and ask you some questions, but no. Patience has to show us that she really does prepare before she comes because even before we got to any rehearsal, she had 30 plus sides slides already prepared with everything she was going to say and it tells us why she is where she is she's not just telling you to prepare she prepares before she shows up so she didn't even wait for questions she had everything imposter syndrome glass ceiling defined outlined ready to go so we really really thank you for first of all for agreeing to do this and for giving an excellent presentation but we, we still have to ask you um, some questions because people do have questions. This was just superb and outstanding. Thank you. Well, Thank you for those kind so, words. Beth. Yes. And, and there's one person whose name didn't come out very much, maybe two, and you can delve into it. One of them, I just got off the phone with her during this webinar because I told her patience is speaking and it's Mrs. Sylvia Boy. Um, oh, wow. She, yeah, she, she, she. She said, you know, Patience is my daughter, you know? And I said, well, Patience has already told us about you. Um, you told us how you were next door neighbor to her. And she shared with me today that she apparently shares a birthday with you. You told us how this woman who, when we were in high school, we used to look at her in awe because she was either the first female director general or something of West African Examinations Council. Yeah. Um, how you looked up to her and how she shaped your life. And she said, your father was her right hand man. So just yeah. so we don't prolong this, I want you to share with us the relationship you had with this woman, how her CEO or her leadership and empowered you to be able to do what you have done and how people should relate to this in their own life. And also talk about your father. How before the age of, I mean, form one would be like nine, 10, 11, you had worked so hard already and you were tired. The role that your father played in your life and how people should use their parenting skills or if they are not parents and they're still young, how they should listen to their parents to get to where they are. So in a nutshell, my question is about Mrs. Boy and your mm. father. Wonderful. Thank you for that question. So my father was amazing. And this I found out, you know, later on. And I just wish you were, you were alive for me to really show my, my, my gratitude. But he knew all of us. He knew what our potentials were. And he worked with us, you know, to um, bring out the best in each of us. So we, we are quite different. You know, my my sister, you know, my younger sister is very creative. So she's not as intellectual, but very creative. She, of course, he made sure he pushed all of us through to university, but she does, you know, those events, decor, those kinds of things. She's very good at it. I'm very like, you know, academically able and he knew it. So he pushed. And that is why when I wasn't given the opportunity, you know, to do additional mathematics in Wesley Girls, he was like, no, you are a candidate for a one in Admath and you will do it. And I did it and I got a one. So he believed in me a lot. And a lot of people attribute, especially family people attribute where I am to his confidence in me. And he pushed me to do a lot. I thought he pushed me too much because he really just wanted me to get the, you know, the highest grade. 
So he really, really pushed me to work very hard, you know, and throughout as well, my, my, my um, educational um, life, you know, my, my life in school and all that, he was very instrumental in getting me to give whatever I did, you know, my best and to excel in it, you know. So really without my father, he was actually my, my champion. And when they say, well, before he for she came, if you remember one of the UN International Women's Day, the theme was he for she, you know. Before he for she became official, my dad was doing he for she, you know, a man promoting women, you know, to, to, to be the best. Because we're all girls, by the way. He had only girls, you know, so he just wanted to make his girls, he wanted to, to make his girls to make him proud. And he did, you know, great in bringing the best out of me. Then he, 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 um, he was, he, and one thing I noticed about him, he used to really respect Mrs. Boy. And that was something that I learned about how you relate with your boss. Because as she said, like she was the head and he was uh, um, her number, number two, because he was the head of test administration, you know, at the time. You know. But he respected her so much. And I didn't hear him say one negative word in the house about her when, you know, she wasn't around. And I'm like, I mean, it's not like she will hear when you say something, but no, everything was respectful. I mean, to the extent that, by the way, she was the one who advised him to, to, to let me do accounting because she was like, oh yeah, accountants never lack jobs. Let her do accounting. She doesn't know what to do. Let her do accounting. And let her do the professional accountancy, you know, certification so that she can be a qualified and professional somebody, you know. And he took the advice. Can you imagine how many people listen to their bosses? He listened. He was like, oh, he came and told, no, Mrs. Boy says that so and so. And, and I also took it because I'm like, hey, this is somebody who respects, uh, you know, his boss. And who am I to say no when Mrs. Boy says you should do, you know, accountancy? So I also did it just like that. And it's worked for me. You know, so really a great example to learn from. And she, being next door to me, and I, I just revered her and realized that she could combine everything. So in addition to being the boss and being really feared at work, because those who know her know she can be firm and tough and sometimes scare people and all that. She also had the soft relationships. She has so many friends. And the old girls, when we talk about old girls network, they, their year group really were close. You know, because most of the time she's having some party and half of the people were old girls and they were just, you know, ah, Yvette. <laughs> so Yvette, Yvette is the other, you remember I said, uh, if, uh, there was another uh, colleague who was not allowed <laughs> to do ad math. And we, both of us believe, we were the two people who believe that we deserve to be in A1 and we're not given the opportunity. That was Yvette. She's put it, I didn't want to mention it because I didn't know that. She'd want me to, but that was Yvette. And look at her. She's one of the, the greatest, you know, dermatologists we've had. I don't know of any. I mean, from Wesley Girls, tell me. But Yvette is just awesome, you know. Thank God that she got the opportunity. Otherwise, I mean, what would have happened? So really, I'm not blaming anyone, but sometimes our educational system is unforgiving. And that was just an aside. I saw Yvette's comment, and I decided to just, you know. But back to Mrs. Boy. Um, subconsciously, apparently, she was inspiring me to aim for the top job, you know, because I saw how well she combined it and um, how, you know, she still kept relationships going with her schoolmates and, and, and how she was still a mother and, and, and a wife and all that. And I said, oh, I really want to be like her when I grow up. And subconsciously, I guess it's all worked in, in my favor. So that's Mrs. Bo. I mean, I, I do really respect her and I'm so, so grateful to her for the input in my life. All right. W wonderful. Wonderful. Uh, Yvette, thank you for joining and chipping in and also dropping pearls. And to the role of fathers, um, Professor Ifa Hesse, who is going to be giving our final prayer, she also talks about how as a young person, her father strongly believed in the role that women could play and encourage them to study hard. And even though back then, women were not being encouraged to take education seriously. Her father played a big role. So um, I think that that is really um, key. 
So um, there are just a few questions here. There was one that asked you to talk about your challenges in the chat room. And there are four questions in the Q&A as well. So I know you've mentioned a few challenges, but could you be um, specific? This person um, just wanted to know some of the toughest challenges you experienced. For example, you just said the finance job is hard. What do you mean um, hard? Is it lots of hard work? Um, is it yeah, a lot of so, lots of numbers to crunch or yeah so so for me my biggest challenge has been how because I've said where I am came at great personal sacrifice you know and so it's it's the price you pay for getting ahead and combining you know the hard work that you necessarily have to you know um give or or or, or the 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 lots of hours that you have to expend, you know, to deliver on or exceed expectations, you know. So I've had to work long hours. I've had to spend a lot of time on projects. I have to spend a lot of time getting um, systems working, numbers churned, etc. And so it takes away from the time that you have with your family and friends, really, you know. And a lot of the times in the final, actually the finance job is like a right amount to the um, CEO. Because if you have a very good finance person, you know, you could go to, well, not go to sleep, but when it comes to the numbers and, you know, the presentations to the shareholders, et cetera, you can rest assured that you'll be taken care of. So you are the one in the background doing the work for the CEO to shine. You know, it's hard work. But then, as I said, it's paid off because if you have a good person, they will recognize it and recommend you when the opportunity comes. You know? So it's just that challenge of, and, and, you, and it's, you, you, you're, you're doing this when you are like uh, in your, young, you're, when you're still a young lady trying to have children, young ch uh, babies, sending children to school, being called for PTA, they said your child is this, and that, you have to combine all that. And we all know that culturally, the woman spends a lot of time with the children and all that, kind. even homework. You know, you've come home, you're at work. They are calling you and say, mommy, oh my, you know, combining all that can really tear, gnaw at your heart, honestly. It, it's, it's a huge challenge. And for me, that has been my greatest challenge. Of course, now my children are much, much older and that is not as challenging, you know. And my husband has also come to terms with, you know, uh, my life and all that, you know. So really, you, you work through things. But if you, especially if you have young children, it's quite challenging. And then the other challenge is also the challenge of working with people and they're good size. You work through people to deliver, but people can be your undoing too. I, I, you, I, look, you can't avoid having cantankerous people around who are trying to bring you down, this and that, you know, all those kinds of things get to you. And also the demands of being in the top job, like you are not there, it's not a free, you're not freeloading, it's not a freelance. There are expectations, you have a mandate, you are given targets, you deliver or you are fired. I mean, that kind of thing. So it's not, it's not, uh, we are not, it's not a tea party, let me put it that way. So there's constant pressure. And when you are not delivering, you actually do feel threatened, you know, and, and that puts a lot of pressure on you. All right. Thank you. Thank you for that generous response. Um, Rosamond Owens had a question. She said, can you talk about dressing for success? And it ties in with a question that I was going to ask you anyway, that how did your feminine energy play into your accent, into, you know, being successful, meaning how did you use your smile, your gentleness? I mean, I know from an intellectual perspective, you're like top of the tops. But did your, your dressing, your smile, your gentleness, your tone, your ability to get along with others, your femininity, did it play any role? But then the primary question was, can you talk about dressing for success? Well, the, frankly, I don't think that <laughs> my dressing <laughs> played a very significant role in where I am. Because I'm, I'm very like... Uh, pragmatic and functional and you know, I, I was raised by a man I mean I need you to know that so I'm not like frills and makeup and you know I have to be intentional about 
that. So for example, I had to quickly go and put on lipstick when I was coming in. It's not the first thing that occurs to me. Let me put it that way, you know. So I, I'm not one to like be intentional and say, oh my wardrobe, I'm, this week I'm going to wear all this. I had to learn, you know. When I And I was a finance director, so I just put on my trouser suit or my skirt suit, and it's normally black or this or, you know, that kind of thing. And, but when I took over as managing director, there were people who thought it was their uh, place to tell me that, oh, you know, as managing director, I think you have to step it up a bit and all that, you know. So, well, I tried to do a few, uh, do a little more, you know, in terms of uh, looking a lot sharper, if you like, you know, and, and, and um, playing the the part. And, and I do, but most of the time I do dress, you know, uh, to make myself happy, not to make anyone happy. Obviously looking professional, as a professionality, I don't joke with it, you know, but, and I try as much as possible, but to say that my dressing will get, dressing it in itself will get you where you want to be. Honestly, I haven't seen, <laughs> somebody says I'm real. Yeah, I'm actually, I actually can be uh, brutally candid. That Another actually ha has, a, has a, a flip side. It also, uh, you know, it uh, endears me to people, but it can also put other people off. So I have to then tamper it because people, you know, people like uh, the fact that, you know, with me, you get uh, what you get is what you see. And they like the fact that if I smile at you, then I'm very happy with you. If I'm not happy with you, you will know immediately. And they, 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 they don't expect that behind their backs. I'll smile at them and behind their backs. When it matters most, you, you know, um, do something that, which is, is what most people do, unfortunately, do something that will adversely affect them. So that actually endears me a lot of the times to people, but I do find that not everyone can handle it. And uh, it's just, you know, getting the, the balance right and treating people according to, you know, um, how they are as people, their, their personalities and trying to work well with everyone. So to your question about, I don't think, actually I, I am very, I can be very forceful and I'm a go-getter, so I don't allow people to get in my way of what I want to achieve. I used to be like, be quite hard when I was finance director. I actually learned to balance things from being less task-oriented and more people-oriented. And I have learned to, you know, um, present or, or to, to show up as a leader you know, in a more uh, people-oriented way, if you like. So um, I, I'm actually very intentional about and being empathetic, you, you know, uh, and, and, and it's being sensitive and uh, treating people and f being flexible. I just saw somebody remind me, ah, Yvette, you know, being flexible. So really, I've learned a lot, and, and that has helped me to work well with several teams to deliver great results. So I've, I've learned, and I'm also very open, and I, I'm, I try as much as possible to live, you know, um, the, 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 or to wear the tag of, the, or as the Bible says, to be clothed with, clothed with humility, you know, and let people know that I know I am not perfect, and I'm very open and transparent, and where I, I got it wrong, I'm, I'm not... I, you know, I'm not, I don't hesitate to say, oh, I'm sorry, you know, that kind of thing. So I found that it works well with teams and I do get along with people to deliver on and importantly, what we are all there for, you know. So it helps to be authentic and summary. All right, thank you. Did I answer much. that? Yes, you did. You did very well. Um, there's a question that comes in multiple parts. I'll try and summarize it. It's from Niyama. He said, we know skin color, especially for those outside of Ghana and gender, are two great barriers. Could you please tell us if you've experienced these in your personal, professional growth? And if you have, how did you go about past these obstacles? Two, I come across people who use this as an excuse for being down the ladder when in actual fact, it could be their personal performance. How do we personally identify whether skin color or gender 
us against performance is playing a role here. And um, these barriers are known to cause mental and psychological issues. What would be the best way to do with these personal effects um, on the individual? Hmm. I, th I think, thank you, great question. I think I touched on it briefly, but my, and I'm gonna talk about my reality because there are people have had different experiences and I won't downplay anyone's, you know, or minimize anyone's concern and downplay. But so I talk about my experience and that's why I say that, you know, it hasn't adversely been, I haven't felt that, you know, I've been so discriminated against in the workplace either because of my gender or my, uh, my skin color that is adversely affected, you know, my rise to the next level. I found that not dwelling on those have actually helped me. So being in an environment where I focused on delivery, you know, has helped and not always thinking of what, how I'm a woman and all that, you know, has actually helped me because when I'm considered, I feel that people talk about my work rather than being a girl or a woman, you know? And I can hold my own. I mean, in any group, for a long time, in any group, it can be all men. For a long time, when I, when I went for a meeting and they were all men, I didn't even notice. I entered the meeting, we are back, to, we are like focusing on what we are there to do. You are delivering, you are not delivering. It's recent times that because people have been drawing my attention to it. My attention, I'm so preoccupied with how we can, get ahead and how we can deliver and how we can exceed the deadline and the target and all that. I don't dwell on being a woman. It doesn't even occur to me in the workplace. Oh, please. I don't. And that's why when somebody asks about dressing, I wear my, I mean, I quickly get dressed and, you know, and, and, and march off to avoid the traffic, that kind of thing. Get into the room and we are talking while we are there. And it doesn't even occur to me, you know, it was later actually, in a lot of meetings, and I then realized that when I look around, they are all men. You know, then I became conscious because everyone was telling me what, how I was a woman and what house, where I am. Do you see? So I find that not being preoccupied really helps you not to have limits because somehow being aware and being, um, you know, it can intimidate you can actually give you mental, and that the question that was, yes, sometimes. So I don't know what people have been experiencing, but I can tell you from my experience that when you focus on that, you could actually be, you know, creating mental blockages for yourself, you know, because maybe they didn't mean that. And there've been several times where I work in a multinational, there'll be several other people act in a manner that you are like, are they acting like that because of my skin or what? But I don't even dwell on it. I don't dwell on it. And we work in, a, in an environment where, you know, results are compared across. I mean, with my skin, I deliver top results. So what are you talking about? You, you know, so I don't allow myself to be bogged down and to be intimidated with that kind of thing. And I feel that it's helped me. Yeah, very, very true. Um, patience, I, I, share, I share your sentiments because for me as well, as a professional woman who's worked most of, the, most of her professional life outside of Ghana, it's just recently that I'm beginning to think about race and even gender because I work in an environment where you have grown men in their 60s asking my opinion to maybe give a consultation about something. And I deliver it without thinking, oh, I'm dealing with a man or a woman or I'm in a room and it's all men we're here because you want my mind. And so I'm sharing my mind, I'm sharing my thoughts. And a lot of the time I forget that, okay, I'm dealing with Caucasian men because you just want my opinion and I'm rendering it period. Whether I'm a, I'm a woman or I'm black, at that point, it doesn't matter. So I, 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 I completely share your sentiments that it's important for a lot of people to get to that point, especially women, where you're not constantly looking at yourself as a woman because if I'm giving my professional opinion, it's my professional opinion, regardless of my race or the gender mm -hmm. that I am. So that, that's important. And um, absolutely, absolutely. Prisla says mind over matter. Absolutely. 
Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, Mrs. F. Simpson, the president of the Old Girls Association, said, Congratulations, patients. This Thank has you. been so real and down to earth, and we're really proud of you. And um, someone has another question. She said, I don't get this self promotion. Can you throw more light on it, please? If I'm working under in an organization where my boss and any other person can testify what I can actually do and I'm doing it, I don't think it's necessary to do that. <laughs> we're, we're fond of saying God's time is the best. So if not being shortlisted is putting myself um, down, um, it just means the time is not up. It's good it worked for you, but how do you know when this is really necessary um, she's the person says she's confused. No, it's just that inner conviction, really. And we are all different. So if you don't feel it's the right time, that's you. But when you're ready, so you know, when I started, I t- I'll tell you, when I took over in the act- acting capacity as managing director for Barclays, it just felt so right. It felt like that is all along. All my experiences, whether the good, the bad, the ugly, you know, all my skills that I've been acquiring, everything, you know, that I've been building over time, you know, had gone into a reservoir and had prepared me and equipped me for this ultimate role. It felt like ultimately this is what I've been working for and, you know, acquiring experience and skills for, you know, it, it, it felt right. It just felt like wow, you can do this job. You know, you actually are equipped. You've built the capacity to do this job. So I was quite sure that I could do the job, you know, and I was doing it, but it turns out that things don't work like that in the, all the time. In, 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 because every, there are a lot of people who all, can also do it and they want it. So it's not a job meant for just you. It's a competition. So you don't help yourself by sitting in your corner and saying, oh, I'm just going to do my work. Okay, maybe you don't want it. And that's what the the, the lady who tapped me on the shoulder and told me, you know, uh, that, listen, do you want a job or you don't? Because if you're competent and you are capable and the opportunity has presented itself, you must put yourself out, you know, and be considered for the job. Otherwise, you you end up, you, you know, regretting. And, and, and when you see somebody else who has taken the job and you realize that you could have done the job, you know, so it's that recognition that I'm ready for this role. I'm capable. I deserve the role like the next person and give me the opportunity that should make you re- And you are not being given the opportunity because people also have their ideas. You know, uh, the person recruiting was thinking, I, I need a seasoned CEO. She hasn't been a CEO before, so I am not going to include her. As it turned out, that doesn't matter because when I took off, I was not, hadn't been a CEO before, but I started doing better than those who had been CEOs for years. My results when I left uh, uh, Barclays were the best in Africa. I went, I left on the high, the most profitable in Ghana, the best in Africa, you know? So really, it, my, then it, it became very clear for the next person, and I paved the way for some, the next person to be taken. And that person was not a CEO of, a, you know, like Abna, my successor, so I beg your pardon, my successor, also was given the opportunity. She's doing excellently because I hadn't been a CEO before and I did excellently. So whoever was making the decision reckoned that we didn't have been a CEO. So I gave somebody the opportunity by demonstrating that. And I did that because I raised my hand. So it wasn't just about me getting the job. Thereafter, I opened the door for other people to also get the opportunity of their lifetime. So it goes beyond just being about yourself and self-promotion. But you then give other girls and other women the opportunity to also fulfill their highest potentials. You know, so I know we are all different and there will be people who disagree, but we, we are all different. And I encourage us to get out of our shelves and put up our hands, you know, because we can do it. And sometimes it will not come to you on a silver platter. You've got to go for it. There are a lot of people, I'm sure, who've had that experience. Go get us. We're leaning. Yes. Thanks for reminding me of the, the phrase. You know, you've got you've got to raise your hand. 
and if you don't want to, that's what I said, it boils down to choice. You don't want to, yeah, I mean, but I, I encourage you to, if you think that you are ready and, 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 and capable, if not for yourself, so that that capable young woman will also be considered because you took the role and you excelled at it. Well, that's wonderful. And, you know, I told people this was going to be life changing. You won't believe it, but I'm sure there are a lot of people who are going to leave this webinar and decide that, look, my hands have been down for too long. I'm going to raise my hand because I can do this. And I think it goes well with if you think you can, you can. And if you think you can't, you can't. The minute you raise your hand and say, I can do it. I think the, 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 the heavens equip you to be able to step into the position and do it very well. And um, so thank you for that response. And someone also had another question that would you do anything differently? Yeah, no, I've got a few. I mean, some I can't say publicly because they involve other people, but um, in terms of my leadership, you know, I've, I've evolved and matured over time. And I do find that, you know, I'm more accommodating of people are more um, considerate, are more flexible a lot. As an accountant, I mean, you know, <laughs> I wasn't that flexible, but I had to learn. So I find that, you know, focusing on, on people a lot more has helped me um, to deliver. And that, that was, uh, it were, it were, uh, they are all maturity, you know, um, lessons. And, and so, yes, I, I would be more people focused you know, from the start, I am now, you know, but I would have done that earlier, you know. So that one, and then also um, I did what, I made one or two recruitment errors that um, not, not because the people were not good, but they ended up being, you know, the wrong fits for, for, for the team, you know. So those are lessons that, you know, I learned along the way. All right, thank you. And um, there was a question for us for this one is specifically for Hollard. It says, please, in getting paid for travel insurance from Hollard, do you need to get a letter from the airline you traveled with to prove it before being paid? Kind of a non-specific. Uh, can, can, we, can we take it offline? Oh, sure, sure. Because yeah, um, I, I wouldn't want to say, I, I directly don't work on travel insurance and I don't want to say something that, you know, uh, I'm not totally sure, so. Okay, all right, so let's go on to the next question it says, how do you manage organizational politics? So, so for me, when people talk about politics and a lot of people paint it as a bad word and everyone thinks, oh, I'm not political. I find that a bit funny because you find that oftentimes those who say oh, I'm not political are really in the thick of things. Maybe you don't want to do, you don't want to call what you're doing politics. The thing about it is that there are a lot of moving parts and relationships to manage everywhere, everywhere, whether it's home, whether it's within your larger family or it's in organizations or wherever. So you've got to play to win. It's about managing, you know, um, the, the pieces well, the chess pieces well to win, you know, and it's not about when, People say politics and they think oh, it's, it's undermining. No, 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 no. It's about, first of all, wherever you are, there are people who wield power. It can either be the, 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 the formal power or informally behind the scenes. You, you don't blind, a lot of us are blind wherever we are. We are not alive to the dynamics around us, the power dynamics and stuff like that. If you really want to play to win in organizations, you cannot be naive about that. You've got to recognize who the powers be, that be are, you know, and how you manage the relationships with them, you know. And I'm not talking about instead of working, go and bootlick and all that. No, we all know that that doesn't, get, I mean, getting ahead that way is not sustainable. You cannot stay in any role you know, and doing that for a long time, you know. I'm talking about, in addition to, you don't bury your head in the work because a lot of the time that is our challenge as women. We think because we are just working, uh, burying our heads in the, in, in the work, things will just work out and somebody will come and tap us on the shoulder and say, hey, you are so great, I'm giving you that next job. No, 
you've got, there are other things. Some of them are softer, you know, some of them are subtle. You've got to be able to identify them and be intentional about, you know, you know, managing those relationships to enable you to ultimately win. So you can't ignore organizational policy. I'm not saying when spend all your time politicking. I'm saying that be aware of your environment and who the, 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 the what the power blocks are, <laughs> you, you know, and know how to manage it to win. And that is a mistake to say that for media, I'm never going to do politics. I'm sure you are doing it. You just don't want to, I, I mean, accept it. Better understand that it's part of moving ahead and know how to manage it to win, you know. All right. Thank, thank you for that response. And maybe my last question, unless other members of the webinar committee have a question for you, um, we can't run away from the fact that we live in a world where we're married, we have children. Um, what do you have to say about specifically how your husband has helped you in your career? And outside of him, just any general comments about bearing the responsibilities of being a married woman, which in our context, we can run away from cooking, cleaning and all that, and how that impacts people's careers. Um, there's some really young ones among us in their 20s, 25, their 30. What should they do um, as married women and still be able to advance their career without feeling like, you know, because they got married, suddenly they couldn't achieve their dreams? Yeah, I see somebody, was it Ravna say, get help. That's a very important advice. You can, you're not a one man thousand, you can't do everything. So very important to have the right support systems in place. And I did have good support. I had, I, I lost my mother when I was very young. So my mother was not around when I was having my children, but my mother-in-law stepped in and she was great at the, providing support. I also had, you know, supports with uh, domestic help and stuff like that. But most importantly, my husband was really supportive and you've got to work at it. And I say to young people that one of them, especially young ladies, is that one of the, you know, uh, decisions that will make or break you is who you choose as your marriage partner. You must be intentional about choosing somebody who will be, who is your friend, who you will grow together with and progress together with. And you will see that early on. So for example, you're all in school, you're all in the university, or you're all in medical school, you're all studying for a long time. You see how he reacts when you are doing well. You see whether he promotes, you go and learn, oh, there's this test though. You know, you see his, how he encourages you. Because when you get married, you don't know what you become. When I was, when I got married, I didn't know I'll be managing director of anything. That wasn't even on my mind. I didn't say, oh yeah, this is my plan. This is my 20 year plan. By that time I'll be this. I didn't have such a long view. I'm visionary, but I didn't have a 20 year view. Do you understand? So I wouldn't have known where I would be. So I wouldn't have you know, said that, yeah, I'm going to marry somebody who support me to be. No, I just married a friend, somebody I could have ongoing conversations with. So even through the difficulties that we did, we did have difficult. I, I told you that, I mean, I had to leave South Africa and come. That was a difficult. When I was going to South Africa, my husband didn't want to go because he's also a, a professional. He also has his practice to, you know, but we, we came to a compromise. You understand? So it's that ongoing conversation and, you know, the awareness that both of us have potential and we need to support each other through. And when you marry a friend, then you can work at it together to the end, you know. So it's actually important. And also how you bring people along as you're progressing is also important. You can be high and mighty all over the place. You recognize that when you come to the home setting, when you come to my home, you don't, there's no MD there. Actually, my family and my in-laws, they call me MD with respect because they actually love the fact that they have a daughter and an in-law that is so high profile and high place. And my family thinks, I'm, and my in-laws thinks, I'm, I think, sorry, think this Wesley girls, you can't be buying here. Think I've, you know, <laughs> think I've brought honor to them. Do, do, do you understand? So it's more like they encourage me all the time to do more and to give it my best shot. You know, now that they see that it actually brings you honor when you have somebody in this position. So it's about knowing how to, recognizing some of the nuances, you know, 
of, of uh, this kind of uh, situation and knowing how to work at it and, and, and using wisdom. Wisdom. Wisdom is so important. You know, in handling, in handling relationships e- e- effectively, using wisdom to bring the best out of every relationship, especially the important relationships in your life. Wisdom, wisdom, I like that. Somebody else had a question, we'll try and be ending. So it says, please, why did you leave Barclay since it's a big job and you were doing really well? Secondly, you must have faced serious ethical dilemmas. How do you go about them? Mm, okay, so how I left um, Barclay, I think I've answered a number of times, but having done the role as managing director, for five years and having spent 10 years in Barclays, I was beginning to feel that my next move was close. And um, coupled with the fact that I had a number of offers, suddenly I had a number of offers because at that time I'd made my mark in the market, you know, and headhunters were reaching out to me. But there was one that was persistent. I wasn't, as you say, you know, actually I left my money there, you know, because I had my long-term incentive that was vesting in 2020. You know, and and it was a, a way of keeping me there, you know, by giving me a long term, something to look forward to. So it was a trade off. I, I actually traded off, you know, something significant. But these people kept kept at it. And I, I mean, the recruiters for Hollard, you know, um, in, in South Africa, because they just had a vision for the business in Ghana. They saw it be market leader. They saw it growing you know, um, exponentially, they saw it be, you know, making inroads and having great impact. And they went out and searched for somebody who had demonstrated that they could grow a business, you know. And, and so they settled on me and they wouldn't let go. I wasn't ready to leave. They kept back. So I, they were a small organization. And I, told, I, I actually tried to put them up with my expectations. They came back, you know, several times, worked it out and said, we will make this thing work. I mean, it went to their highest, they went to their shareholders to try and tell them that we want this person. It also plays a lot of pressure on me, by the way, when I came, because like I came, you know, at such a high, you know, cost to them that I had to deliver, you know, that kind of thing, you know. So after a while, I began to think and say, you know what, maybe God is telling me something. Because I tell you that, I told you earlier on that my faith plays a, a very big role in there steps I take and the decisions I make because nobody likes you that much. So God may be trying to tell you something. You see what I'm saying, you know? So really I looked at it and I said, oh, these people have been too persistent to be ignored. Let me look at the offer properly. And all I wanted was at least match what I have. I didn't, I wasn't trying to, you know, um, get more money out of them in the short term. However, I looked at the future of the business and what that meant for me in the long term, first of all, you know, I was looking at my age. I mean, I was, I left when I was uh, 2018, I was, I think, 48 there about, right? When did we become 50? We became 50 in what, 2019? Yeah, I think so, you know. So really, I was looking at it, I said, I, I, I can't practically, I can't be in Baptist for the next uh, 10 years until I retire, 11 years until I retire. You see what I'm saying? You know, they won't even, I'm, they won't even uh, nobody has been there in that role for that long. Anyway, you understand it. After a while, your, the zeal comes down it, naturally. The diminishing returns sets in. So it will reflect in your results. You know, I didn't want to wait till that stage. And I looked at this. This was going, was given to give me, was going to give me renewed energy, was giving me a new opportunity, um, a new lease of life and going to extend my career life, you know, to, to do, to grow this business, I can actually grow it until retirement, if you see what I'm saying, which is something I couldn't have done in my previous role. So as I say, I, I do take a strategic approach to things and having weighed all that, I can tell you that once again, it was the best decision I took. An excellent. So it's not always the here and now. I find yeah. that a lot of people can't make long-term decisions. More people make decisions on the here and now than for the future. And that has to change if you're looking to go the long haul and long-term um, aspirations. 
All right, so I will combine the last two questions into one. Um, the first one says, what do you do if you're rising higher than your husband? Um, you have been very specific, but people want to know, what do you do if you're rising higher than your husband? And then how do you handle women in the workplace who are not so accommodating of women rising on the corporate ladder, as you mentioned previously? Frankly, that's why I said that. Sorry, I, I sorry. Yeah, frankly, that's why I said that calls for a lot of wisdom, you know, because the fact of the matter is that as women, we wear many hats. I'm not a boss at home. I recognize that I'm wearing a different hat when I come home. And I do like the home environment. I like the companionship that being married gives me, you know, and it becomes even more important when you are growing older, when all the, my, my children are all in, my, my, in school now. So we are back to the, almost back to the empty nest, you know, period where we look forward to seeing our children because now they are hardly with us. So if you haven't developed that relationship, if you haven't spent time nurturing that and you're becoming friends with your husband, you realize that you don't know what to do you know, when you are together, you understand. So for me, it's too important a relationship not to cultivate and spend time on. And I don't, as I say, when you come to my house and I invite you, you come to my house, you won't, you won't know there's an MD here. Actually, right now, I, I prepare dinner myself. I don't do that all the time, by the way. I mean, this is COVID. We've had a lot of time at home. So I went back to some of the things that work for a nice home environment like cooking myself and doing stuff like that, you know. But where I can get help, like I have a live out help cleaners that come in and clean and do stuff like that. I do take advantage of them. And any day I will, but I work on the important relationships in my life. And I do spend time working on my relationship with my husband. It's not always easy. And in the past, as we grew and we're all like, you know, getting, trying to get ahead and all that, it's taking a lot of wisdom. And sometimes you have to, come back and have conversations you know but the, the the good thing is that we both want this to work and so we've all worked at it you know and that has helped us to keep the relationship going but i won't say that because you should stop getting ahead because your husband is not getting ahead no why hold back your ambitions and your potential and if he's actually your friend he wouldn't want you to because where i am and what i've achieved is working for everyone's benefit. And anyone would want that. Who wouldn't want? My, my husband is very proud to have a, a wife that is a managing director of something. He proudly introduces me. Oh, my wife is so, so oh, my wife is so, so. Who wouldn't want that? And as I say, my in-laws like me, I mean, for, for you know, what I've achieved. And they are very proud to say that, oh, yeah, that's our sister-in-law, that's our daughter-in-law, you know. So in reality, people want to associate with success. How you act, and you must act wisely, you know, um, very aware of some of the pitfalls and the snares that being successful can pose for your relationships, you know. So be very careful, you know, to be humble, remain humble at all times, and be conscious of, of, of cultivating the important relationships in your life intentionally. But you can't do anything about being a high, I mean, if you married a high flying woman, for me, it's a blessing, really. That, that's Obviously, true. if they threw their weight around and made you feel small, that's, that is a different thing. And that's why I'm saying wisdom, wisdom. So wisdom is the principal thing. And you yeah. mentioned humility, which is key because if, if you're growing up and you add pride to it, um, you will fall very, very quickly. So I think humility is a key thing. Um, before we give, um, allow Miss, um, Mrs. Ama Engman to give her vote of thanks, you've mentioned your faith in God several times. So I want that to be your concluding remarks. As you talk about, I know the Bible talks about they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their yeah. strength, they'll mount up with wings like eagles. Given how much tenacity, grit, etc. that you've talked about. Just talk about how your faith has practically 
helped you to get to where you, 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 you've attained? So a lot of those who believe that being a Christian and a strong Christian at that, you know, it's a lifestyle. I don't think that Christianity and religion should just be relegated to Sundays and what you do in private and in church. I believe that you live your Christian life out there for other people to be inspired, to want to follow what has made you who you are, you know? And indeed, the first time that the disciples were called Christians was in Antioch, as the Bible, you know, makes us to understand. And it's because the other people observing them noticed that these people were different. You know, they were doing things that made them stand out. And that's why they were called Christians in the first place. So I don't believe that you, you hide your religion. And especially in the environment that I worked in a lot of the times, multinationals, it, they view religion as something that is private and you mustn't speak about it. But I disagree. I beg to disagree because for me, you know, the, what the Bible says about letting your light so shine, so, uh, you know, wherever you go, so that men will see your good works and glorify your father in heaven has helped me to accomplish what I've accomplished, not just for myself, but for all the organizations that I've worked with. Because the hard work I put, my, you know, fixation on excellence, etc., is because I want to shine for the glory of God. I realize that I'm a, an ambassador, a representative, you know, wherever I am, and therefore I must be a great example. So I incorporate faith in my work shamelessly. You know, I, I mean, everyone knows I'm a Christian. I pray when I have to pray. I do, go do what I have to do. And I, I hold me accountable. I mean, my values are Christian values. And that's why, for example, I, I, you know, I apologize very easily. You know, I try to. So really those kinds of things then, and, and also I demand a lot of work from people because you must work as if you are working for God. That's what I believe in, you, you, you know. So those things have helped me actually. Living the Christian life has helped me to do well in, in, in the workplace because I believe that you can actually fulfill your highest potential when you bring all of yourself to work. And you can't leave part of yourself being a Christian or, or your, your faith at home and come to work. That's, you've left part of yourself you know, somewhere else and you've come to work, how can you be the best that you can be when you didn't bring all of yourself to work? So it's about bringing all of yourself to work. And my faith is a very significant part of who I am. And I don't mean words in, in placing it at the center of how I do my work. And I believe that that has played a lot, you know, a significant role, has played a great role, you know, in, in, in getting me where I am. Because I believe that, my purpose, you know, I'm living out my purpose and God has been ordering my steps and everything has just lined up to enable me to accomplish what by the grace of God I've been able to accomplish. So on that note, thank you all very much for this great opportunity. All right, okay, thank you. Amma, Amma, you're next. Amma, Amma Engman would give us a vote of thanks followed by a prayer, closing prayer by Mrs. Professor Ifo Hesse. Well, hi, everybody. You all agree with me that the past few hours of our lives have been life-changing. <laughs> we must all have picked up something from every stage of Patience's life. She has told us her story from when, even before she went to Wesley Girls High School, right through until now. And she's even told us more about and like her future and everything. So Patience, we are so, so grateful for your advice and um, the nuggets of wisdom, which I'm sure we we'll, we all have taken something from and we'll also be using to advise the people we mentor, our children, and even our friends and colleagues. Um, thank you once again for your time, your willingness to come on board. We enjoyed working with you and um, your passion is so palpable that it just gives everybody a good you know, feeling. Um, we know several old girls also have hit the glass ceiling and we look forward um, as a team to work with them in the future. To the webinar committee, um, I'll just go over the names again, Professor Ifa Hesse, Dr. Hannah Aite, Dr. Sewa Ai, 
a rub maki will make it to emisa pinky kwashi shila pata samantha porsche beatrice blue and myself i'm my ang man i'm like we just pan over i'm like a, you know like a long um we are drawn from different age groups from the 1960s to the 2000 and some things and we are all kind of scattered all over the globe but we all work together and um it's been a joy working with everybody we will also express our gratitude to everyone who came on board um we couldn't have done this without your contributions and um, your questions and answers and everything and we look forward um, to working with all of you in the future and we definitely will have a recording available for everyone to share with your networks and those who are not able to join us this time patience thank you once again i mean i i have experienced you coming home from work with me and my kids in your house and announced and you setting a booth of different dishes for us to enjoy. Thank you. And I, I testify to everything that you have said. So I'll hand over to Professor Ifa Hesi to give us the, um, the closing prayer. And thank you once again to everyone. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Um, lovely, lovely, lovely evening. Thank you so much, patience. It's all been said. Shall we share a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, we thank you for this opportunity to come and hear from the experiences of your own children. Lord, how you have guided them and guarded them, their steps and their path. Father, the lessons that we have learned from this, we pray that we'll be able to apply them in our lives knowing that you have said each and every one is precious in your sight and you have a plan and a purpose for everyone. We pray for everybody who has listened to this, that something will reflect and something will touch them and a difference will be made in their lives so that all together we will contribute to make this country what it needs to be, Lord, each of us playing our part and all of us together as Christians, as a whole, as old girls, as all members of the Ghana community. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity and pray for everyone far and near that you bless them, be in their homes, bless them. Lord, protect them and continue to guide them. This we ask in Jesus' name with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you all for being a part of this. And I'm going to kindly ask the Mrs. Patience and the webinar committee members to just rejoin for a few minutes. We're going to end it so that participants can um, sign off, but we'll just rejoin and regroup very, very briefly. Thank you so much. <laughs>